A warm welcome to the Stream Around the Clock conference, We Need a Change, which is organized by the Formwelten Institute in cooperation with Lean Bay. I am Rebecca Manos, your facilitator for today's session, and um, it will be my task and my pleasure to steer the conversation and to ensure all of our guests will have appropriate time and opportunity to expressing their views and opinions. And I am more than then pleased to be here today um, upon invitation by Gitta, who will also be here in the background, sometimes asking a question when she feels there is the need for it. And um, as I said before, Gitta, I love your work and your determination, and I am happy to be part of this conference. So thank you very much. Thank you, Rebecca. <laughs> this is a treat for all of us. <laughs> and Absolutely. <laughs> And I really admire the way you handle all this with grace and smarts. <laughs> Thank you so much. So what is the conference all about? Actually, Gitta's idea of starting this conference is to bring four currents of our time together, which is basically the systemic society perspective, climate and sustainability, transhumanism and new leadership and new economy, actually to help all of these currents to get out of their silos and to get into a dialogue which is with each other. Um, in the session before, we also spoke about conversare, which means somehow communicating and dancing together. And that's um, the whole idea of the conference, to make people speak to each other, get into dialogue and develop together new ideas that might change our future and our tomorrow. So um, Gitta is part of Formwelten Institute. Actually, Gitta is the founder of Formwelten Institute. And um, we were thinking maybe some of you might at least enjoy a little introduction into what Formwelten is. So actually, it is an institute that is there to promote specialized, renewing, innovative research projects and applications within and from the fields of humanities, systems theory, and scientific mathematical theory of complex systems. The main focus of Formwelten and the central motives is actually the development and the construction of bridges in space and time, in communication and mind, to carry both science and humanities into the future, to evaluate achievements effectively, to critically analyze what needs to be provided and shape the world in an active cooperation. If you want to learn more about Formwelten, you can always visit their webpage, which we have put here below. So for today, what we have planned for this session, we have about three hours planned with you. Um, after the introduction that we just started, we will start um, the introduction of our guests. So I will present very shortly each one of you with the data that you provided us with and with the data that we could find on the internet about you. So you will make you here a surprise as well. Um, then we will have a keynote by Petra, our keynote speaker. She will speak about 30 minutes in her keynote. And afterwards, we will invite each one of you for a guest statement up five to 10 minutes referring to your own um, viewpoint on the topic and also referring to Petra's keynote before. And that will be in alphabetical order by last name. So I will call you and invite you to the stage then. Afterwards, we will take a short bio break because that's always necessary for some comfort. And then we will go into the open dialogue, also introducing some questions and um, yeah, comments from the YouTube channel as well that we also had in the session before. So that's how we will be starting. So uh, welcome for today then. I'm just stopping my screen sharing here. And I have the pleasure to introduce our wonderful guests today. And I will start with our keynote speaker, Petra Künkel, actually Dr. Petra Künkel. She is the founder of the Collective Leadership Institute. Hello, Petra. A Germany and South African based social enterprise for transformative change. She is also an executive board member of the International Club of Rome, dedicated to human well-being and planetary health. She is, leading strategic, she is a leading strategic advisor to pioneering international initiatives that tackle sustainability challenges and has released several publications. 
Petra lives in Berlin. And is that also where you are dialing in from today? No, I'm dialing in from the countryside north of Berlin. Beautiful. Thank you for joining. The next person I have here on the panel is Stefan Bauer. Stefan is already smiling at me, so welcome. And Stefan is a transformational international HR leader, organizational architect, consultant, and speaker. He stands for a 21st century leadership philosophy that fosters humanity, health, and sustainability, and brings along 25 years of HR experience in the global pharmaceutical industry. Quite long. He is also a member of the board of the Association of International Management Consultants. And Stefan lives in Germany, says my note. So I'm curious, where in Germany is it? You recognize this painting? It's the, it's the Olympic Center in Munich, my hometown. <laughs> Beautiful. Very happy so, to join you all. So a warm, warm greeting to Bavaria, Stefan. Welcome. <laughs> yeah. And I have here the next one, my pleasure to introduce to you Simon Maluki. Hello, Simon. And Simon is an award-winning hotelier, trainer, mentor, and environmentalist with more than 18 years experience in projects in Kenya and Uganda. He is currently working as a conference coordinator with commitments on environmental protection and so social life structures to impact change. And currently Simon lives in Nairobi in Kenya. A warm welcome to you, Simon. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Next one I have on my list is Alex Schleber, someone who is already very busy tweeting about the conference. So Alex, welcome. Although we cannot yet see your beautiful face. And I guess maybe, Alex, you might need to redial in because we can't see or hear you right now. Okay, while Alex is trying to fix that, I just go on with the introductions. Next one I have here is Yip, Yip Ta. I hope I'm saying that correctly. Okay, perfect. And actually, Yip, I also met you before on LinkedIn a long time ago when you started your first mindfulness conference. So I'm happy to see you here again in this round. Welcome. And Yip is a management consultant, executive coach, and then inspired mindfulness and meditation trainer. She has founded the Mindful Coaching Academy, is a social entrepreneur and committed to contributing to advancing the sustainable development goals regarding healthy lives and education. She is the author of the book, Beautiful Brains Change Tomorrow, Today, Honest Conversations with Heartful Change Makers in Business and Society. And Yip also lives in Munich, Germany, if I'm not mistaken. So just around the corner from Stefan, perhaps. Maybe, yes, hello. Hello. And then a very, very warm welcome to Markus. Hello, Markus. And Markus Will is the co-founder of a company specializing in software development for energy management and greenhouse gas accounting. Very interesting. And a lecturer and affiliate of the Zittau Görlitz University of Applied Science. He is also a member of Dean Nagus, the standard committee which is responsible for interdisciplinary generic standardization in the field of environmental protection at national European and international level. And he also lives in Görlitz, Germany, where he also teaches at the University of Applied Science, right? Right, correct. Hello, everybody. Hello, welcome, Markus. So now I also have David here again. David, it's a pleasure to welcome you again. We also had you already in our last call. And um, about David, David actually comes from a pioneering career in the smartphone industry. And um, today he's the chair of the London Futurists, a meetup dedicated, um, a meetup dedicated to the discussion of the likely impact of technology on human experiences. 
He is also director at the Transhumanist UK Party, campaigning to changing the political landscape to including the insights of transhumanism. He has written six books and um, edited several more. He lives in London, UK, and um, he says about himself that he has been carrying a smartphone in his shirt pocket since 1999, which is uh, for 24 years. And he told us before that's not the same shirt, which we are happy about. So we also hope that's not the same smartphone anymore. Otherwise, it might have historical value, David. There's a lot of historical value in the history, and we can learn from the history as well, which is one point we may talk about. Great to be here. Absolutely. It's great to have you. And now, last but not least, I hope Alex has been able to connect with us because he is dropping in and out. Um, I will fix that while we are starting the keynote, but I will just share a few words on Alex as well so you can get to know him, although he is not yet with you. Actually, Alex Schleber is a researcher, strategist, and consultant centered around observed psychology and neuroscience. He is something of a strategic art director, helping others to create their brand, product innovation and marketing from one holistic strategic intent. As a global citizen and father of a one year old, he decided last year to put his expertise primarily in the service of climate emergency. And he lives in Frankfurt, Germany. So we have quite a diverse set of guests and speakers here today. And um, I am so much looking forward to your conversation. But first of all, I'm looking forward to Petra's keynote. She will be speaking for roughly 30 minutes. And just for Gitta, I would like to ask you to put it to speaker mode and for the others to enjoy the ride and follow Petra's presentation. It's your stage. Thank you very much. I will, um, as usual, share my screen so uh, that we can start the keynote. Wait a minute. So, is that okay? I think everybody can see that. So, the topic of today is economy of the future and climate crisis. And uh, yes, I'm number one grateful for the invitation and thought this was uh, really an exciting conversation that we're going to get into. I will take a little bit of a, a kind of um, overall kind of um, yeah bird's eye perspective today on on the topic on the on the issue. And um, so, wait a minute. Yeah, okay. The climate crisis as we as we have it at the moment, of course, we know it is uh, intrinsically connected to our economic model, to our economic system. But uh, we cannot we cannot say that it's just simply the neoliberal economy. Although uh, we will go further and see, you know, there is uh, it, it's quite a culprit of the situation that we have. But we have moved now with the many people that we have on this planet into almost I, I would say a collective pathology. I'm in you know one of my um, professional streams. I'm a, I'm a psychologist. And a pathology is, is self-destruction is really a pathology. So uh, we are in that situation and we, we, we do have the neoliberal economy as being promoting, you know, the situation that we have at the moment. But we must admit that neither communism nor socialism have led in the long term to the well-being of people and nature at scale. But, um, you know, many of these different economic systems may have hidden jewels, you know, that so far we haven't unearthed or we, we have put against each other. And maybe there's time for an economy of the future that we really look at um, what it means to bring the good things of the different economic models together. But the climate crisis is also a political crisis. And I put this picture on here. It's the drought monitor of the German Helmholtz Institute. And uh, this is not a sub-Saharan Africa where I have experienced uh, climate related drought in Zimbabwe in the 90s and it's not southern Africa where I've experienced drought in 2015 the water crisis in Cape Town it's Germany and I think this picture is saying something that is so extremely important how slow people understand what the climate crisis actually means and I'm just um, you know putting the picture of 2020 
in addition to this. And you can now see a trend that um, it's probably difficult to ignore, uh, but it's it's very slow. So it is a the climate crisis is definitely if you look back at the last 50 years, a result of not understanding what exponentiality is and what tipping points are. And it, the, the really weird thing, the bizarre thing is that now the Corona crisis has really taught us what exponentiality is. And so we have to do exactly the same as we did in Corona. We have to flatten the curve in the climate crisis because we are in an exp exponential curve of, of um, reaching tipping points. So the climate crisis is also caused you know, by this economic self-destructive behavior, although the individual might not notice that. And you know, with our consuming behavior, we also may not notice it, but it's ignorant, it's greedy. And this is very much supported by the neoliberal narrative that is ingrained in so much of our thinking and acting so much that we sometimes don't even notice. So I think it's good to remember that uh, there were people behind the neoliberal narrative. And I don't want to say, I don't want to make them a culprit, you know, kind of and say, you know, this is why we, you know, they brought us into the mess. But in a way, um, the narratives around the neoliberal paradigm accelerated the situation that we have. And I think uh, just as a reminder, it is uh, really the, 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 yeah, the, the, the narrative that the business of business is profit and that the freedom of the individual is much more important than anything else. And that governments should be kind of weak and uh, that the market will solve all problems, but it doesn't. And we may not throw out everything, but uh, it's clearly uh, the neoliberal narrative and the economy that we have is definitely in a crisis. So in addition to that, the climate crisis is furthered by a, what I would call a distorted worldview of planet Earth that you know, as a disenchanted machine that we may or may not be able to repair. And that has a tradition that is much longer, much older than the neoliberal narrative, because it goes back to in a couple of hundred years, you know, it goes back to Francis Bacon, to Descartes, you know, to many people who actually describe the world in a more and more mechanical way. But today we have taken over that view almost uh, across the board, although we will later on see, not everybody thinks like this. And there were people long back, like for example, Alexander von Humboldt, already in 1798, who said to his colleague, we should no longer see nature as a mechanistic system, but a living organism. And this insight will revolutionize science. It hasn't done, it hasn't revolutionized science so far, unfortunately. But this light mindset of life, um, as a mechanic is very deeply ingrained in all our global systems in all societal structures in the educational system in the financial system in the political system and in the system of business transactions in the financial system in the kind of in, in the way we operate in the way we consume etc and even in the medical system people are you know tend to be treated as objects you know that that need to be repaired so so we, we, that isn't an easy thing to change because it is across the board, it's global, it's ingrained in almost everything that's thinking. So um, I think we are, we are back to a topic that is probably really addressed at this con conference. And it is the mindset, it's the consciousness, it's the way we see the world. So what is interesting is that there is a long, long chain of people who are thinking differently or who have been thinking differently. And the, the, the interesting question is how have, why are they being ignored so much? And why have they been ignored in the past? And I'm just going through ex a few because there are so, so, so many. Uh, one is Jonah Macy with a strong Buddhist uh, background, a system scientist who says, you know, like uh, we cannot actually be objective because the known and the known cannot really be separate. And those of you who are familiar with quantum phys physics know that quantum physics says something uh, similar. Elizabeth Saturis, uh, who has worked a lot on, on in biological systems and has um, an interesting look at the world in, you know, looking at the world as, as, as nested living systems in mutual consistency. Margaret Whitley, a leadership expert and a system scientist who say life in life relationships are much more important than 
uh, things or the kind of thingness. <laughs> and Andreas Weber, um, he comes from Berlin. Not too many people know him in Germany, more in Canada and the US. <laughs> And he is a biologist, a semi-biologist and a system scientist. And he says life actually is intentional because life wants to be more alive. There's an intention, there is an emotion, there is feeling that is extremely important. Jane Jacobs is an architect, an American architect, um, a city architect who says, you know, like the aliveness in cities is extremely important and we need to construct cities in that way. Christopher Alexander is also an American architect um, not looking at cities, but looking at buildings. And he says, you know, we need to construct buildings in a way that there is aliveness possible in these buildings. And, and so there is a connection between things, a relationship between things that creates a degree of life. Janine Benyus, um, who is known uh, for the biomimicry approach, who really asks, what can we learn from nature in, in the way we co-construct our realities? and in, in the way we invent things. Evelyn Fox Keller is a, is a, a scientist, a, a theorist, a philosopher, and has written a lot on the connection between love, power, and insight in science, so that science is not really something objective, but they, you know, that it's intrinsically linked to our feeling. And most of you know Donna, Donella Meadows, who says, you know, may, actually we, we need to dance with systems, we can't control them. And uh, that's, uh, although um, Donella Meadows has, has done a systems modeling, so she, she, she had a very kind of, you could almost say an engineering approach. And she uh, is one of the co-authors of the Club of Rome report, um, No Limits, not, yeah, Limits to Growth. <laughs> yeah. And um, <clears throat> so, Another one is James Lovelock, um, who has developed the Gaia theory and looking at the planet as a living organism, as an interconnected whole. And some of you may know Polly Higgins, who unfortunately passed away last year, um, who is really was fighting for acknowledging um, ecocide as a kind of, uh, as an injustice and, and uh, creating a law around this. So there are many, 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 many more people who actually think in that direction, but, but that's almost like uh, it, it hasn't become main, mainstream, but for a future economy that should save us and, and create a different kind of planet, it is extremely that these, important that these mindsets are becoming mainstream. Although they are different, they're coming from different um, directions, et cetera. So the, the mindset is absolutely key. It's the view of reality, it's the view of the world, it's the framing of belonging identity. That is what is determining our action. And in, in that way, I uh, just kind of show the quote of Joanna Macy. Uh, it is important that we recreate that love for life because that is going to drive us to, to really change the economic system and to also overcome the, the climate crisis. So the mindset um, that further a new economic architecture, and I call it architecture because uh, there may be within an architecture different economic systems, but that places life and systems aliveness center stage. So we really need to understand what gives life to systems because that is so paramount. Uh, understanding that on small scale, on large scale in societies and technology in in nature, etc., is so absolutely important. I've written a whole book, which is a report to the Club of Rome, on uh, on what the systems aliveness means and what it means to steward that systems aliveness, because uh, that's going to be the core task of the future. We need to actually steward conditions that we cannot control, that we may not even be able to steer. So that's why the term stewarding is important because stewarding means creating conditions. Uh, so we, we need to create conditions for interwoven social, economic and ecological patterns that further systems aliveness in, yeah, in all systems, in small systems and big systems, et cetera. So what is already happening um, yeah, towards mainstreaming such a mindset? There is not one mindset, it's not one opinion, it's a variety of opinion, it's a complexity, a diversity of opinion, but all it all rests on a completely different relationship with nature and sees human being as being part of a natural process. So if you take a deep dive, dive, dive into what is happening, it's actually mind-boggling 
and not understandable that we are still where we are, kind of five minutes more and we approaching the collapse. It is a different view to say, could it be that we're just five minutes away from a positive tipping point so that we can really shift the system? And if we look at what is happening, it, it's quite interesting to look at the different societal sectors, what they're doing. And uh, I believe that the world is still operating and we are still operating and being able to hold this conference because there are so many civil society organizations and environmental and social issues that actually keep things in place. And there are even more, more initiatives are coming. The, the issue is that, um, uh, you know, there, there is a contradictory current. So, so the, the NGOs, the civil society organizations actually have a repair function. You know, they are con constantly repairing what gets broken and, and broken and what, what is destructive. And examples are WWF, Greenpeace, Oxfam, but there are many, many more on local levels, on, on national levels, etc. There are many regenerative communities that actually do implement economic changes on, on a kind of on a small scales. They kind of live a future, you know, on a, on a small scale. For example, the regenerative communities network, the permaculture network, and many, many more. So I would say they're walking in the right direction. That's why they get a green traffic light. Uh, if we look at the private sector, it's quite interesting that there are increasing efforts to uh, to kind of redefine and lift uh, corporate responsibility, and, and that is really on the increase. If I look back at the last kind of 15, 15 years, and those of you who are in, in uh, also kind of advising companies, uh, they, they, you all know that, that there has been a massive shift in, in understanding that corporate uh, responsibility is so extremely important in, in shifting towards sustainability strategies. But, they, they, but it's, it's also clear that, that there is some greenwashing <clears throat> and many have good intentions, but they are totally and utterly captive to the global economic dynamics and to the finance system. So just examples are, just top examples are the global responsible leadership, uh, that was founded by Daimler, the, the B team, the B corporations. So many are active, but the, the, they are also in uh, increasing number of, of company, company alliances. So that, that um, look at, at uh, finances, that look at banking on values, you know, that, that, that is an interesting alliance. The alliance to, and plastic waste, there are many, many companies that get with other companies Companies together in order to, to make a shift. But can they become transform transformative while keeping the system? So uh, that's why I say, hmm, okay, like I'm generous, I'm giving them a, a, a yellow traffic light. Science and academia, uh, it's quite interesting because there are more and more uh, publicly funded research that is going on on social issues and also on transition and transformations. So this is a really good news. But there is a fierce a competition that more and more actually the research institutions are subject to the ne neoliberal narrative in the way they operate. And um, there is also more and more research collaboration um, on sustainability issues around, um, yeah, across countries. I don't know if you're familiar with the Future Earth Network and the Earth Commission, etc. So that's really, really interesting. I would also say that's a yellow. There are the social movements that we are all aware of, Extinction Rebellion, Fridays for Future, et cetera. And um, the Fridays for Future, I think you've probably uh, heard it in the news in, in Germany, they have managed to, to met with the Chancellor Angela Merkel for one, uh, one and a half hours. That's a lot of time. So this is really, uh, the question is, is that, is that uh, bringing the shift that we actually uh, need, to, need to have? But, Honestly, they have done a really fantastic job in the last two years to, to not only uh, kind of alert people to the climate situation, but also connecting the climate crisis with an economic system uh, that is actually broken. If you look at the public sector, uh, then uh, surely there is quite a lot of work to do. And that's why also a lot of activists focus on convincing uh, people from the public sector, from governments to act differently or from multi multilateral organizations. There's definitely a slow implementation on the ground 
although there are lots of regulations in the right direction already in place, but there's also increasing tendency to authoritarian states. What is interesting in terms of the positive examples are the well-being economy government alliance, uh, where already Scotland, New Zealand, Iceland, and Costa Rica are members. And I just brought this as a provocation because you know this is a funny thing that uh, went around uh, WhatsApp. It's not actually so funny, but it is something to think about uh, what it means to lead countries through a crisis like Corona, and if there is a connection to the capability to do that, um, to the capability we need for changing economic, the economic architecture and overcoming the climate crisis. But I would still give, although there, there, there are, you know, kind of um, a few countries going in the right direction, there is a lot of room for improvement. So what if serving life became the basis of an economy of the future, then it would mean to actually co-create responses to really fundamental questions. So the one question would be how to embed the narrative of care for human and planetary well-being in all economic paradigms that should be self-evident, but it's not yet the case. How to strengthen global and societal structures that empower people to contribute with their thriving economic activities to their own and others well-being. So that contribution is a, is a, is a very, really important question. How to foster technological, social, digital, scientific innovation that continuously guides economic action towards nurturing life support systems, people, nature, etc. How to measure economic results. We all know that GDP is, is the standard measure and it's not doing the job at all how to measure economic results in relation to a collective value for people and planet. How can we, how can we implement this? How to co-construct enlivening participatory governance mechanisms. The authoritarian state is not going to solve the climate crisis nor bring us an economic system, you know, that is really to the benefit of everybody. So uh, we need governance mechanisms and, and what are they? and how to strengthen regulations and further also resource allocations of incentives and taxes, et cetera, uh, that would safeguard human well-being and together with the planetary life support system and not separate the life support system from people. So it's quite interesting because there are a lot of emerging, um, yeah, emerging ideas um, that um, I just throw at you because there's so many economies, you know, that that are coming, coming on and where people really put a lot of thought behind this. And definitely the mindset that I've been talking about before is uh, behind most of them. So that I think is very, very interesting. If we look a little bit closer to the thought leadership that is underway, then I would like to mention people like Maya Goepel with a great mind shift because it's, a, it's really worth a read in, in, in the way she, she underpins that, that mind shift is so extremely important and how uh, the prototypes of, of, um, of new ways of economies are actually actually yeah living these different uh, mindsets and uh, Hunter Lavins with the with the economy in service of life the book title is a finer future kind of looking at um, how nature can be a guide you know for for economic activities looking at uh, Catherine Trebek from the well-being economy alliance and the economics of arrival you know where the the, the human mindset and the human relationship uh, places you know must be placed in the, in the forefront of economic activities or are uh, very well known at the moment Kate Raworth uh, the with the donut economy economics uh, that is taken up even by cities, you know, like Amsterdam, you're looking at, at um, creating an Amsterdam that is operating within a donut. And um, Mariana Matsukato, who's uh, going in a slightly different direction, but has a lot of work and influence on the European policies uh, in terms of rethinking capitalism, in terms of um, looking at the, at the role of the state and the, the role of the state in innovation. Or Marjorie Kelly, at, and Ted Howard with the making of a democratic economy, also looking at, 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 at organizations and how are they owned and, and what, you know, what's the influence on, on, the, on the economy. Or um, yeah, Lorenzo Fioramonti on, on uh, what it means to place well-being at, you know, at the forefront of economy. 
And most of you would probably know Naomi Klein, you know, who say, you know, we can do either or, you know, with capitalism and uh, overcoming the climate crisis is impossible. Or John Fullerton, who is uh, also in the US and he has, has developed principles for regenerative capitalism and uh, for, a, for an economy that is actually a regenerative economy. So there are lots of people with lots of uh, brilliant thoughts. And I'm just putting this picture that you might be familiar with. That's the donut of Kate Raworth combined with the planetary boundary uh, kind of image. Uh, that was developed by the Stockholm Resilience Center and, um, and you know, particularly also Johan, Johan Rockström. And so the, the big question is how can we live well within the planetary boundaries? And what is interesting in terms of the features that come across um, in many of these suggested approaches is uh, very, very clear that we, we, we need enlivening narratives. We need to redefine the purpose of economic activities and um, you know, as the picture before showed, uh, the the, it, it, the economy needs to be in service of life support systems and people. We need enabling structures. There are lots, lots has been written, you know, in, uh, to, to different degrees on redistribution of wealth, and I think that has been known for for many years, on on redistributing economic power. That you know, that the that the big multinational companies that actually are they, 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 they're not kind of walking us into the future, you know, that even, even if, they, if they have a strong corporate responsibility, uh, that, that's going to be difficult. So we need to strengthen local economies, smaller economic units. And, and what is also coming through is that innovation isn't just any kind of innovation, uh, no matter if it's artificial intelligence or uh, technical or medical in, inventions, it is really the, the focus needs to be on regeneration and on the circular flow of resources and materials. And there's a lot to learn from, from nature. And um, what is also cutting through is we need new metrics. So there's a lot of uh, talk about happiness index, about sustainability indexes, about well-being indicators, etc. Uh, there's a lot, a lot out in terms of thought leadership that, that can be taken up. So we really need to measure what, what needs to improve planetary and human well-being and not growth. So, uh, and the other thing that also cuts through is the, the really the governance mechanism that um, it's so absolutely clear that um, further developing our democratic systems is at, absolutely at the, at the core of a new economic architecture. And then quite interesting, there's a lot said that, that we need a stronger state. The weak state that is part of the neoliberal paradigm is really out its past. We need a strong state. And a strong state doesn't mean an authoritarian state. A strong state, a state means a, a good governance, a trusted state, and um, multilateral, in, in multilateral institutions that are effective and that we can, that we can trust. So the, the interesting thing is that um, the, 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 the paradox that we are approaching here is, and those of you who are familiar with chaos theory, um, Kastri always say, you know, in order to, to change a system, you need to destabilize the system. You know, you need to bring in perturbations, as it's called, in order to bring that system to the next level. So I took this picture from an article on ecological restoration. So this is maybe unfair, but I thought it is a really, really nice uh, picture because we need to talk about a positive tipping point for a new economic architecture. And uh, what, what are the small changes, the series of small changes and incidents that then become big enough, big enough to actually bring our system to a different level, the, the economic system and into a new economic architecture. And we will fiercely see the resistance and we also will experience the resilience of the current economic system. And we are all part of feeling that resilience because it is so difficult to change. But here's the paradox. The paradox is that in terms of the economic system, it looks as if we need to get this over that threshold into a new and different kind of systems that operates in a different way. But if you look at the climate crisis, we actually need to get it back into a previous stabilized, stabilized system. So here we have the paradox, we need to come throw the economic system over a threshold, yet we need to stabilize the planetary system 
and and the climate in in a, in, a, in a state you know that we can handle and um I, I i can't solve that paradox i leave you with a paradox but i thought it's quite quite interesting to to just become aware of that paradox so the the interesting thing is what it means to operate in this paradox is we need to actually have very very different strategies at the same time so we need to definitely connect the future economy thought leaders that is totally and utterly neglected i think Rebecca, you've been talking about overcoming silo thinking. Yes, overcoming egos and saying, you know, my approach to a future economy is the only one valid. Yeah, we really need to get people together. Uh, we need to prototype economic practices, share and evaluate, because there are lots around. And some people know of each other, others do not know each other. We need to connect climate activists with pioneers of a new economic architecture. And we build, we need to build a network of individuals and institutional actors into what I would call a global transformation network. And that network, and that is increasingly being the case, you can observe this, is a network of meta collaboration. So it means that collaborative initiatives would be collaborating with other collaborative initiatives yeah, to, to really get this to, to scale. But is this enough? I don't know, but just kind of as an example, <laughs> uh, the Club of Rome has a, initiated together with the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research and the WWF, a, a, a planetary emergency partnership uh, that looks at um, urgent actions. And, and by now, after I think a year or more than a year, yeah, I think it's about a year, and there are more than 200 institutional actors in regular communication. And, and these are the examples that are so extremely important. So it's a kind of the plenary emergency action plan is a guiding agreement among experts. You know, the, the details might be different and there might be different opinions, but it's, it's, it's about um, just societies. It's about transforming energy systems. It's about shifting to circular and regenerative economies. And you might say, you know, this is still in that, um, in that bowl you know, like um, reforming the system, that might be the case. But I do think um, we need the radical transformation and we need prototypes of radical uh, transformation, but yet we also need the incremental improvements in order to deal with climate crisis. So I definitely think we need both. And uh, that was it. Thank you very much. I'll leave you and let's get into a dialogue on, you know, what this means. Thanks a lot. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Petra. A very impressive uh, presentation, actually, but also very easy to follow. So thank you for all those thoughts, all the research that without no doubt went into it as well. And um, it's a great kickoff for a nice discussion. So what we would like to do now is that we invite all our other guests to give their little statements towards your presentation and towards their own view of our topic, economy of the future and climate crisis. Um, we are allocating about five to 10 minutes to each of you as you are quite a big group. I would like to ask you to rather try it with the five minutes. Um, if you have slides prepared, feel free to share them, but it's not a must and a not something we are asking for. And we are starting this as we are very organized and structured here um, in alphabetical order by last name. So actually, Stefan, it would be your first invitation to come to the group and share your thoughts. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, and uh, it's all very well structured and I admire your facilitation. And I would like if I could disrupt this a little bit, this structure. Um, this has been so rich, what Petra just shared, and so much in sh such a short time frame. I would like to spend one minute of my five minutes on the well-being of all of us and then all the, um, the visitors of the conference in, in a short meditation, in a short breathing meditation, just one minute. You know, let's, after all what we've heard just now, it's hard to swallow. And... Um, so I, I invite you for a short breathing meditation. If you please, it's just one minute. If you just close your eyes, please, and um, try to relax and take a few deep breaths.
And um, if you breathe down to your abdomen so that the oxygen goes into your body as much as possible, as deep as possible, long and deep breaths. And if you please come back slowly into the conference, open your eyes and uh, let's come together again. I hope this was healthy for, for everyone. Yeah, so I'm Stefan Bauer um, from, from Munich, you know, as you can tell, 25 years of HR background in a global corporation and some more business background before that. Um, yeah, Petra, this has been so rich and impressive. Um, it's hard to follow. And also, um, you have shared so much that it's hard to add anything from a content perspective. So maybe just a few thoughts. First, um, I have been working as a business person, as a practitioner since 1977. Um, so I have been one of these business people contributing to the current state, you know, in my small way. But um, over the years, uh, I have transformed and uh, I have now a much higher level of consciousness. And um, it's clear if the economy does not transform to support a global sustainability, the human species will not survive. The planet will survive, but not the human species. It's just the question, are we talking 100, 200, 300 years if we continue the way we do it? And if I can transform after all these decades in the business, there is hope that others can transform as well. So there's a sign of hope. Number two, when I listen to you, I'm thinking of a wonderful book from Thomas Kuhn from the 1960s. And Kuhn, uh, the title is The Structure of Scientific Revolutions, where I think Kuhn coins the term paradigm change. Uh, you know it. And um, Kuhn describes how scientific revolutions occur. And it's this innovation curve, you know, at, the, at first there are a few um, unconventional thinkers that see something that the majority doesn't see. Uh, then there are some innovators who jump on the bandwagon who, who think, well, this person, there is something, uh, some truth to it, uh, even though it's against the grain. Then you have the early adopters, then you have the followers, then you have the latecomers, and then you have the hardcore resistors and as far as I know, even Albert Einstein, uh, to some of the scientific innovations of his time, he was a hardcore resistor too. <laughs> so even, even, even good, good Albert Einstein. And what I see at the moment is that, you know, when I compare the second half of the 20th century and I compare where we are today, I see that we are at the beginning of an innovation curve as is described by Thomas Kuhn. So I see many signals and signs of these innovations. And this conference being one of them, what you just shared, and you shared many examples of being part of that. And uh, jokingly, I always say, we, we live in the post-capitalist society, but most have not recognized it yet, you know? <laughs> so I truly believe that. And uh, so we are, um, in the 21st century, we want to build on a lot of good that has been created in the second half of the 20th century. A lot of global economic good has been created, but the negative side effects like, uh, like crises, like many illnesses, you know, when you look at cancer, when you look at obesity, uh, diabetes, when you look at depression, I mean, it's, it's epidemic. Um, 
so and and then you look at obviously the, our environment that is the destruction of the environment uh, completely unsustainable and um, i see a paradigm change happening i have two daughters uh, one of which for example is just now doing her masters in uh, in international sustainability so there there are signs that we are at the beginning of an innovation curve um, I, I don't underestimate how dire the situation is, um, but I, I am an optimist. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm part of a, of a number of people um, of these innovators in Germany, we call it the Augenhöhe movement, who want to live and work more intelligently, more sustainably, more uh, healthier, with a higher quality of life, less materialistic, more sustainable. And there are many, many uh, people going in that direction. Also, you know, Christian Felber has developed the common goods balance in 2010. You mentioned it on one of your slides. And um, I, I may share that our German subsidiary of a global pharmaceutical corporation, you know, we are the first pharma company um, that has um, a common goods balance since January. It's a certified common goods balance. And we are the daughter company of a, of a New York Stock Exchange based uh, global corporation. And if we can do it, many others can do it as well. And so what I think needs to happen in the 20th century, organizations were focused on the well being of the organization, you know, especially shareholder value as, as we know it. And in the 21st century, organizations need to have a broader perspective, need to be focused not only at the organizational well-being, but also at their contribution to the common good and to the environment. So the perspective of the responsible people, the leaders needs to expand beyond the well-being of the organization to have a more holistic mindset and that's that's what we need um, you know how much do we all contribute to the common good to the environment and I'm, I'm not talking about greenwashing i'm talking about that every organization should have a common goods balance or something like it and the the importance of a common goods balance should be the same like any other financial balance sheet that an organization had then that would be a breakthrough and um, yeah, I know it's a long way to go. Um, I, I'm trying myself as, as a, you know, uh, someone who, who transforms myself, who tries to help others transform and to tries to engage in societal transformation. And that's why I'm so happy to be with all of you today. And I look forward to continued co-creation and collaboration with all of you. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Stefan, for disrupting us and also for sharing your personal growth journey with us, which I think is always beneficial and admirable. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. I would like to ask Simon for his statement. Okay. Yeah, thank, thank you. The, thank you for for this time. Uh, to, to my side, I, I will talk more about uh, what has been uh, affecting uh, mostly, uh, mostly uh, our country, Kenya, uh, or the issue of uh, the corona, pa corona pandemic and its, uh, its effects. Uh, like now to my to my side eh? i may say for example now like uh, i'm a hotelier by profession and uh, it has uh, negatively uh, affected in this manner you may find uh, uh, there were some uh, there were some uh, some guys who were, who were working and uh, mostly on their revenue generating, it was a uh, hand to mouth. 
at this particular time you may find uh, that particular person is not in a position to to provide for example for the family and uh, it has uh, affected mostly you may find uh, on the issue of uh, on the issue of basic needs and when i say basic need i talk about food for example you may find uh, the provision of a balanced diet in a, in a in a family setup from one family to the to the other it has uh, affected in many families that's some talking in a, in our country because of a, of the of the coronavirus pandemic uh, this one has happened uh, mainly because to the issue you may find now the government on the measures that has been put across the country in curbing the the spread the spread of the of the of, of the virus and uh, in this on the measures for example like uh, the lockdown which have been put in place we have the issue of curfew and uh, in this manner you may find uh, the scarcity of uh, food of uh, food produce it has a uh, negatively affected because uh, the richness of the diet on the way it's supposed to be it has it there is a, that impact whereby you find guys are not uh, easy rich on those uh, on those commodity so in that manner i may i i, I may say uh in the environment you may find uh the well-being of uh of uh of the of the of the human race has been affected i may say about uh organization some of the organization have been shutting down in our country uh mostly because of uh, the effect of uh, the effect of uh, of this pandemic most of the organization were positively impacting to the to the society in a, in in a uplifting the environment uh some of them according to some of them as per their budget they were impacting positively to to the environment in a, in making sure the the environment the way the way it is uh to the common one inch in one way or the other is benefiting from uh, from it there was the issue of uh, the planting of trees for example now like in nairobi uh we have uh, like the nairobi river thus some of the organization were imparting were they were imparting a uh, positively to it in uh, in making sure that the the nature we are going green in uh, planting of trees how to to make to make sure that uh those trees we can get means and ways in uh, in keeping them in a in a natural way and that was a uh, for example like the, the rain pattern in our country when the the covid-19 uh, in uh, impacted that was around in april that's the the rain is the the rain season when we came to around in may whereby it's not a rain season you may find some of the organization that were that had shut down are not in a position to to impact maybe in irrigating the the green nature that they had uh, they had practice in making sure that the nature goes green you may find some of the of the trees that were were planted uh, along the nairobi river some of them are drying uh, are drying uh, are drying up and uh, from that you may find uh pollution is also affecting the the human nature so from it you may find environmentally it's uh, it's negatively uh, affecting the 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 human race that's in a in our country and uh, i may say 
about like now like a, a hotelier you may find uh, like now in the game reserves uh because of the of the uh, job cuts currently you may find there's the issue of uh people going now to the game reserve they are doing they they, they are hunting down they're hunting down the the, the the nature trail for the for the game meets and some they are hunting down the, the the for example like the the elephants because of uh because of uh their produce by doing so you may find we are losing we are losing much in the in the wildlife and not seeing the future of what the wildlife can bring not only to our country but also to to to, to the earth planet because from that you may find most of uh, the tourists they normally come to 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 our country and in this manner uh it's only about the 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 the, the wildlife that attracts and from the attraction that we have if now we continue with how it is we we are losing much and by losing much you may find also even the the government is losing in a generate in a in re revenue ge generating and also apart from the government also as uh, the employees from the the camps from the hotels where we are working we have been most of us we have been laid down and from that you may find about uh, the nature trail has been affected has been affected and also the the effect also you may find about the the erosion because the human nature has invaded also the the camps with their with their domestic animals they are invading the the nature trail from the invading of the nature trail at the time being we may find that if the climate is not conducive the rain is not uh, promising so the issue of erosion also comes up and from from the issue of uh, uh, erosion you may find also the 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 nature is being uh, uh, negatively impacted and from that you may find uh, in one way or the other the human nature the human nature is being affected from it thank you thank you simon thank you for giving us this yes account of how things are connected and how they are impacting your world our world and also how COVID has played a role into that so absolutely a very insightful statement thank you and um, next sure. of all my dear colleagues i would like to ask you to keep it a little bit shorter because i think you all would also like to talk to each other and not just listen to each other but talk so um next one would be alex Alex Schleber, would you like to share a few words on your opinion and a statement? Hi guys, can you hear me okay? Perfect. Okay, great. Sorry, sorry for the uh, tech problems there earlier in joining, but we got that cleared up. Okay, well, I do have a presentation prepared. Uh, I can try and go through it like quite rapid fire. I, I do feel like there's some interesting stuff for all of y'all in there, including some references to the you know issues around narratives, especially uh, that were alluded to earlier in that great talk uh, by Petra, and um, so I would hope it'd be of value to y'all. Uh, but by all means, do cut me off at any time <laughs> if I go too long. I can refer re uh, do do long talks on any one of these items, you know. So, all right, why don't I just do the screen share now? Um, Okay, the good old PowerPoint here. Um, is that coming through for you guys? Share, there we go. All right. Yep, we can see that perfectly. Okay, so let's just start. Oh, here we go. All right, all right, all right, all right, all right, all right. Okay. So guys, um, so the specialties of mine, and that's also by way of introduction, are things surrounding storytelling, narratives, narrative strategy, PR, you know, crisis narratives, and uh, the like. 
And uh, one of the smarter things I had heard about the entire Corona uh, virus pandemic uh, that also I think we can see relates to the question of the climate crisis is the virus is not interested in your fear, only your DNA. It was one of the smarter things I heard. Um, so a lot of these, you know, social mythologies that we do have, especially in the United States, I've lived there for many, many Alex, years. Alex, you're not sharing your slides correctly. We're just seeing the slide nine rather than slide one. Oh, I didn't go, okay. It didn't go to one. You're sharing the PowerPoint editor rather than the view. Okay, I had switched that and I guess that's lagging behind then. Hold on a second. Let's start again. Um, Look like great slides. <laughs> thank you. Um, okay. Well, if you can see this, so is it now on, on page one? I yep. might just leave the editor. If for whatever reason it won't switch, then uh, I'll just leave the editor. That's fine too. Here, we'll just pull this over. There we go. Is that is that better? Is that on page one now? Yeah, that's on page one. Thank oh, you. Okay. All right. There we go. There we go. Okay. Um, Right, so narratives around this sort of thing, you know, especially in the US, I've lived there for over 20 years, uh, are always like, well, you know, how do we how do we beat this thing? How do we fight this thing? Fighting wars, fighting and so forth, violence. And of course, all of this is completely irrelevant to the current situation with the pandemic and the COVID-19 is not impressed, shall we say. Okay, so uh, just again, by way of introduction, what I do is this brand strategy stuff, product ideation, narrative strategy, and I've worked with a lot of uh, startup founders, solopreneurs, small, medium-sized businesses uh, on creating, you know, their origin stories for their brands, for their teams, that sort of thing, creating culture for budding teams inside a startup, that sort of a thing, okay? Um, so on the climate uh, crisis front, um, it feels to me like even before the pandemic started, we, we definitely have been in a weird pattern of, you know, there seems to be some progress, uh, but then there are also steps back, you know, like uh, on the one hand, uh, you know, we have the Fridays for Future movement really coming into its own, a lot more people waking up because of the droughts since 2018, the summers of 2018, 2019, and now even into this year people are waking up and there is more wind power and solar power being installed. But on the other hand, the German government, for example, these are all just examples, right? Uh, are, are somehow then trying to put weird uh, shackles on the uh, wind power expansion, for example, which is a weird thing. And the Germans did in the last year. Now this year, of course, it's gonna look all different, but in the last year we're buying almost like a record number of cars and a lot of them being, you know, like the large, SUVs and so forth, uh, BMW, for example, canceled its small, reasonably sized uh, EV uh, offering, the i3, stuff like that, right? So those are the kinds of things, obviously, that I monitor as a, as a marketing and branding guy where I, what I, where I mostly come from. Okay, so here we have Greta, and uh, she's quite an interesting phenomenon, certainly, and I think almost everybody has thought that. Now, I tend to, or I have the benefit of being in the position to sort of look at it through these archetypal lenses, uh, the core archetypes as I call them, but certainly it starts with one child, right? Sitting out front of her school and then uh, into last year uh, and even the beginning of this year, you have, have these sudden mass effects, asymmetric exponential uh, growth and progress in awareness, let's say in this case, that's been going on. So that's, that's a big plus. Uh, here's just a real quick, you know, kind of view of how I tend to look at these things, analyze them a little bit, you know, it's like the trickster is one of the core archetypes that includes the idea of the special child. It's a very, you know, the special child from Moses on upwards, if you will. Uh, you have the you, 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 Odysseus, Ulysses figure in um, the Iliad and Odyssey, uh, winning through uh, trickery and asymmetric means. Uh, then you have the, the David versus Goliath might be the most maybe globally recognizable um, image, uh, imagery and metaphors there. So anyway, so I look at stuff like that, you know, including some a phenomenon like Greta and, and do my analyses. Uh, interesting enough, like there were a little bit of, a, I felt like a disturbance in the forest happened a little bit with the thing with the, uh, with the sailboat trip, which for all the 
positive intended of all the positive intentions of why she was doing it and what you know, attention she was trying to draw to too much flying and yada yada right all this stuff it did almost like didn't quite fit with the rest of the narrative and, and it, it created a lot of backlash um I, I wouldn't say in that positive uh certainty but anyway and then this all got sort of washed away and subsumed by COVID-19 uh coronavirus arrival there's the uh, other trickster special child you know that's that girl that somebody placed I think it was actually a marketing uh thing initially in front of the uh bull of the Wall Street stock exchange you know the bull market uh, signifying sort of neoliberal uh, money and capital order, right? So, but even all that is somehow currently in the grips of uh, COVID. Okay, um, and then one of the things that that um, I do tend to think in these terms, you know, archetypal kind of tribal mind firmware. So I do think about like what are the you know things like totems in a way, right? Like so, the car, among other things, is one of those totems of German society. Maybe the second main leg uh, maybe being soccer among other you know there, there's probably a few others but soccer and cars certainly big in germany beer i guess so the car as a as a totem but really going beyond that right uh it's 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 but the 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 industry is certainly constantly being talked up as like being the motor of german um of of german industry and so forth right and um this famous quote from Upton Sinclair, I think probably most of you have heard before, it is difficult to get a woman or man to understand something when their salary depends upon their not understanding it. So that's the quote that everybody knows. And of course, you know, from the point of view of corporations, that's certainly true and people being in these businesses and building these cars and whatever, whatever it is that, that they're doing there specifically. And, and uh, Stefan had kind of made reference to the fact that in whatever small way, you know, in a corporate setting we do contribute to these entire systems and machines, if you will. Um, so here's an interesting one and, and uh, Gita had introduced me to the, or reawakened my, my, my uh, looking at the, car, the term fetish, that really you could replace it by saying like, it is difficult to get a woman uh, or man to understand something when their fetish depends upon their not understanding it. So that's really more from the consumer perspective, right? So. Um, people have all sorts of, you know, needs and uses for cars, real or imagined, and a lot of them go way beyond the idea of getting from point A to point B. We all do know this, right? Status expression, status needs, uh, thrills, adrenaline, rush, racing, all these things, you know, so all of these are actually uh, core archetypes that are being pointed to without going too much deeper into that right now. Well, the interesting thing with stuff like this is, right? So here you can see Lamborghini even says, you know, we're designers of experiences there in the, in the uh, tagline on the uh, Twitter profile. Um, well, for example, this um, uh, Bugatti firm being, being basically in the same league, you know, uh, of creating like old couture car stuff. That's of course not supposed to be owned by tons of people, but it does signal it does produce the signaling and the car culture that then trickles down all the way down to the most commoditized baseline models in some way, shape or form, right? Just like uh, fashion industry and haute couture works. So this is owned by Volkswagen Group, which is so supposedly supposed to be so into creating, you know, uh, electric vehicles and, shift and, and shifting gears towards that. And um, well, yeah, they're still doing this stuff too. So how do we get rid of this programming that's going on both in just the, the sense that it's being done, but then also if you know something like 35 billion per year are spent globally, about half of that in the US on programming people with just the car industries, advertisements, marketing, branding efforts, uh, all the quote unquote experiences. So you know, how do we, how do, how do you go up against that? Uh, my own minor, minor contribution here is the idea that we could go up against it with, um, you know, memes or, or uh, sort of in a direction of making fun of it, rather than trying to say, no, this is just bad. This is just, you know, you guys are crazy. This is all bad. You almost sort of just have to show it in its own environs and show that it really almost at this point just makes so little sense. It's, it's ridiculous. And if you will, there's a small assist here from the pandemic that you can go against it and say like, look, 
I mean, it was ridiculous before, but right now with this going on, clearly it's even more absurd, ridiculous, perverse uh, than it was before. Okay, uh, shifting gears here just a little bit. I'll try to keep that part super short. Um, so here's something that marketers, branding people work with. You know, they slice up, this is in German, but you, you, get this, you get the sense. We basically have on the X axis, people's openness to change and on the y-axis, people's uh, resources, uh, you know, income or otherwise. And what it really just, this thing here says is, there is a relatively small percentage of the total um, amount of people there that is particularly open to change and or also able to, at least as far as their resources are concerned, uh, you know, go along with these changes, you know, try new things, try new products, uh new technologies and so forth okay so this question of openness openness to experience is from the neo5 uh you know uh, personality dimensions that are sort of like a meta study of other systems of personality studies including myers-briggs mbti which is somewhat out of favor but it really actually is very much in there still too so anyway um and and it's just worth pointing out that it really is thought that Openness to experience, curiosity, what have you, is somewhat of a fixed trait. So you're just not very easily going to be moving people around, let's say, on this particular map here, right? So that's important to get. Um, this is Which expressed, is and I think... Quite uh, interesting, I think, also for the discussion that yeah. will be coming ahead. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, Stefan, I believe, had already, or somebody earlier had referred to uh, some similar concept here that there's sort of the 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 crossing the chasm is this uh, idea uh, that was introduced uh, diffusion of consumer products, new technology adoption, right? And that you have the early adopters, and then you have an early majority, and then late majority and laggards, people really lagging behind, and then you have this chasm, there's a break there that's the difficult part to jump. And certainly, let's say, we could, we could probably make the argument that in, in terms of awareness of the global, uh, of global warming, climate change, uh, climate crisis, that the awareness has really jumped into the early majority and even is starting to trickle into the late majority. That's a one good step, but simultaneously that the same couldn't necessarily be said for um early majority on taking views how to how to you know live differently use differently have you know consume less use different uh energy forms use different vehicles and so on and so forth right so there's we're still very much here at this chasm at this at this gap and trying you know to cross it um certainly then same as with the with the openness and the sinus milieu's view here Right, that basically these people here are going to take a long time. If you're focusing most of your energy on trying to convince them right now, you're probably wasting uh, that energy to a, to an extent. And you could also argue that um, they just these these people will need so much social proof. So the social proof will have to be produced by the early majority really coming on board uh, for whatever it is that you're trying to do. And without that social proof, they will very unlike they'll be very unlikely to move unless something, let's say, like um, COVID nineteen. Alex, yes, thank you so much yeah. up until now, and I think some of that could actually be very valuable also in the discussion coming on later, sure. uh, which we will have if we also let the others have a bit of time. Absolutely, to share their okay. Thoughts. Like I said, uh, can keep going on these things for a long time. Let me just finish on one key slide here. Let me see uh, what my favorite one was. Um, so I was trying to get here into something about the social mythologies and how COVID has certainly like, you know, swept those away. And just to give you a sense, since we are talking also about uh, uh, governments and institutions and the funds, the resources, the money, the taxes and all this stuff, well, here's the thing that the Germans were pretty big on up until very recently, which was their black zero, the Schwarze Null, uh, which is basically the in, in the US system, the idea of pay go. So you can only spend money as a government that you've already taken in and otherwise we can't do anything. So we can't uh, really invest in future tech, future things unless we've already somehow paid for it. 
um, really in a form of financial perspective makes extremely little sense. And bizarrely enough, all of a sudden, poof, it went up in smoke. Um, corona, uh, COVID-19 basically just completely did away with this thinking from one day to the next. The, the entire German government said, yeah, sorry, we have to give that up. And it's like, oh, I thought it was written in stone. So anyway, uh, I'll leave you with that. There's more there, but I hope you get a little bit of a sense of the kind of stuff uh, that I do and how I think about this stuff from a narrative perspective. All right, right. thank you guys. Thank you so much, Alex. And also thank you for relating to actual political things happening in Germany, which I think is very helpful for people. And last but not least, let me just mention that this is just the first conference, but hopefully not the last one. So even there will be much and many more chances to share your thoughts because I think they are valuable and they need time and space to be laid out. But um, still, I would like to invite actually Yip to share a few thoughts and words on her position. Yes, happy to do so. So first of all, thank you very much for having me. It feels like coming home, being with this group of people who seem to um, all care care about um, contributing to the world. And I think contribution is is a word that my my statement will focus on. I did bring some slides because I come from management consulting and I guess we cannot do without slides. So let me share, but it's only nine slides in total. So no worries. And this is the title slide. So there's only eight more to come. So my statement is about the stakeholder economy and how doing well and doing good in business and society works. Um, I have a QR code, but that will come later at the end as well. So in case you want to follow up, you can just scan this code. So there will be two statements um, that I want to focus on. The first one is as a mindfulness and meditation teacher, as a Buddhist, a Zen Buddhist, I actually think in order to transform we need to start from within. We start from ourselves, right? And daring to care requires a bit of courage. It requires to combine the mind and the heart. And then the second um, point I want to touch upon in the next five minutes is we will also need to find systems that encourage the caring for each other, that support collaboration. But let me start with the first one first. So one of the elements I've been looking into very deeply for the past around three years of my life is understanding community. And you can maybe see the community, I split into two different concepts. And the two concepts are communication and the second one is unity. And I, let me start with the latter, with unity. You see a circle, in my view, that could be you know, a, a symbol for planet Earth, or for society as a whole. And it has three parts. You see the you and the I, and we stand under the it. The it's something that is maybe bigger than ourselves, right? And the beautiful thing about having things in that kind of circle, this triangle, we are connected. And sometimes it's me on top and I need, I have needs and the community stands and uplifts me. Sometimes it's you that is on top. And sometimes it's the it that is something that is meaningful for all of us in any meaningful way and in any way we consent for it to be meaningful. And understanding has a different dimension too. So understanding something means not only that we stand under it, but it also means we have an idea, a concept, and we need to bring it to our feet. It needs to travel through our body so that we get an embodied understanding of things. And this is very important to me because I feel like I attended um, Davos last year. I attended Davos, the World Economic Forum this year. And people have been talking so much about purpose-driven economy and we need to change and we need to bring shareholder capitalism to stakeholder capitalism. But I think what is lacking is actually the experienced understanding of what it means to suffer, empathic understanding that connects heart to heart. Because if we only have this concept in the mind that there are people that are suffering, 
maybe that in Kenya there is now currently um, a bigger impact due to the ecological crisis experienceable, but we do not connect on a deeper level, we cannot really relate to it in a deeper sense. So it's quite impossible to build community in the global sense. And the communication part of community, um, Gita is the expert in that. So I'll probably leave it to her to, to share more about communication. But for me, communication is communication in peace and communication in a way that we speak and listen to each other so that we can understand each other and not speak just to, you know, um, share things, and just speak to answer things. And um, we don't want to do that in, in, in a world where we need care for each other. So daring to care starts with inside out. We have to align the head, the heart. And when it travels through the body, we get an impulse to act. So that would be actions of our understanding of our insight. I do think communication needs to start with deep listening and deep listening in the sense of trained listening. So maybe I could use another word saying that's professional coaching. But I do think not only coaches should have the skill to listen to each other, but also every human being and also every human being should have the right to be listened to to be understood, to be seen. So that's the first part of how I envision a future economy to look like. But I think this is not sufficient right? because there's only so much you can do when you transform yourself and you can maybe transform people around you because they see you are happy and you're joyful, you're not suffering, they want to learn how you do that. And then a small group is starting to transform. and. I do not think this is sufficient because I think we also need the outside in view. We need the system to encourage our transformation. So how does that work? Um, I'm a very big fan of game theory. I'm a very big fan of capitalism. I actually do think that, you know, the liberal narrative is that Petra shared in the beginning is actually not that far off. You can optimize for things. You can optimize and the homo economicus would work too if he were not biased, but the bias can be solved if you practice the mindfulness and reduce you know, the, um, the blind spots, right? That we can all train with meditation, mindfulness, and coaching. Um, I also think the moment we take into consideration that optimization um, doesn't need to mean optimize for financial wealth only, but it can mean to optimize for societal or planetary well-being, optimizing for contribution towards reaching that state. In that sense, we can actually use the free market um, models to, to steer and allocate economic resources. So let me share with you one example of a project I'm working on just to make clear why I'm speaking about stakeholder economy and how the shift from shareholder capitalism to stakeholder capitalism can work. So this project, Unit Ventures, we're a global organization. You could maybe compare it to Wikipedia or the Python project or any kinds of collaborative, um, autonomous, decentralized organization in the internet. And what our use case is, is we specialize in tokenizing assets. And we create marketplaces. We have already 38 marketplaces launched. You can imagine it's like Uber or Airbnb, where you go on a platform, you search, and then you, you find a, a service provider, and then you hire the service provider, you get a transaction, and you pay a booking fee, Yeah, just like Uber. The problem with these models that we had seen in the market is that value creation is happening through, let's use the example of Uber, through the drivers that bring people from A to B, right? And the more drivers drive, the more consumers use the Ubers, the more valuable the company is. But where actually is the value created going? It's not actually going to the ones who are creating the value, right? It's going to the ones who provided the capital, the investors. 
And that is quite a common thing when you look at the VC world, business angel investment and so on. Um, we have in, in US, for example, there's regulation that you can only be an angel investor if you have 1 million US dollar in net worth, for example. So becoming an investor and then benefiting from new projects is not always an easy thing. But using tokens based on the blockchain, this is something we can solve technologically. In our case, we use our own tokens. The overall token is called the unit. And then we have different platform tokens, like different currencies. And that is the first part. So basically, uh, I need to go back. What we do is we're trying to solve the problem of inequity by making everybody becoming an entrepreneur or an investor into our system. So because tokenizing assets means everybody who buys a token or a currency, a unit, is a shareholder in the project. So it's just like a Genossenschaft in German, a cooperative model um, facilitated by technology. The second problem we are solving, and this is paying into meta collaboration, we want to foster a co cooperative economy. And the way we do that, this is just game theory, right? How do you align incentives um, and reduce in conflicts of interest? And we do so by rewarding, like by designing systems that reward contribution and collaboration so that we create an economic system where everybody wins. Why? Let me share that at a very concrete example, and this is almost the last slide. So we have this marketplace, and one of the marketplaces is called CoachFind. So you go on coachfind.org, and then you can give in your address, like a, your, your city, and then you can find a list of coaches that are um, listed as service providers on the platform. You can hire them. So let's say I'm a coach. On there, I charge 100 coach units per, per session. And how does the transaction work? I receive 80, 80 coach, and 20% is going off as a transaction fee. And this 20%, it doesn't go only to, you know, to, to the investors, but how we split it up to make it a stakeholder economy or a co cooperative model is 5%. They go to the one who brought me onto the platform because without this person, the transaction would not have taken place. The other 5% go to the one who brought you, the customer, onto the platform. Because again, without your contribution, this transaction would not have taken place. And then obviously we need maintenance for the marketplace, for the code fund platform, maintenance for the unit platform. So a share of this also goes to the marketplace and to the technology operator. But once again, the technology operator is owned and the marketplace is owned by everybody who owns a token. So basically we're, aligning the or what we are actually doing is we're closing the gap between the shareholders and the stakeholders by using a tokenized systems model um in in this way we think we have created a a platform and an economy that helps people to always invest into supporting each other because there's actually no way you can lose either you win because you got the deal, the 80%, or you win because somebody else that you brought onto the platform created a job and earns, or you win because the token is appreciating in value and you own a token. So, right, it's overall a closed around um, economy. And with that said, I think I am done with my statement. I want to invite you to scan the QR code and join our community. We have already around 15,000 people all over the world um, living on this. The, the token is already, um, you can purchase it already on our platform. And by that, you can contribute to supporting micro entrepreneurs and supporting yourself even if you're like a service provider in any of our 38 platforms. Thank you very much for that. Thank you so much, Yip, for sharing your approach on closing that important gap between, between stakeholders and shareholders. That's really cool. And uh, last but not least, we still have two people who would really like to share their perspective, Marcus and David. Um, so, Marcus, the stage is yours. Let us know your thoughts. 
Hi, uh, thank you. I was just putting down a note, a final note on that presentation, which was very interesting. Um, how much time do I have, Rebecca? Preferably five minutes. Okay. You can make it. In free, then it's also good, yeah? yeah. So I prepared some slides and, you know, I got uh, such a lot of uh, input uh, in this session and the session before that uh, I'm not so very sure w what my uh, most liked slide will be, but I, I just start the presentation. Can you see it? Can you see a presentation? Yeah, we can. We see the title slide right now. All right, that's very good. Thank you. Um, something on my background, I'm teacher at a small university for sustainability and risk management, and I'm also consultant and I founded a small software company some years ago, but that's not the, uh, the most interesting thing right now. Um, um, in my consulting business, I, I work together with small businesses, mostly from automotive supplier uh, industry. And um, when we go back to a lot of things that have been told by Petra, for instance, um, there are some, let's say, in Germany we say Sachzwänge, uh, or um, let's say limits of freedom that those kind of companies have in order to engage in sustainability. And I would like to talk a little bit about that, but Rebecca, please stop me in three minutes. Um, what I tell to my students or what I start in the, in the workshops on sustainability management of companies is uh, the so-called Mickey Mouse model. And then I try to, um, try to pave the way to the donut model. Uh, from Kate River, for instance, uh, we heard about that already. So that Mickey Mouse model actually means that um, in German we say dasselbe in grün, which means something like uh, we do actually the same thing in a company that we have been doing the last 25 years, uh, but now we try to uh, respect some social and environmental aspects too. And we do that with environmental management systems, ISO 40001, for instance. Uh, the problem with that is that um, it often, it turns into greenwashing or to do as much as is enforced from the legal side or from direct customers. So one could say that actually that Mickey Mouse model of sustainability in a company is more damaging and leads us to a way that is actually ending in, in, in collapse. So where we need to go is via the sustainability sweet spot where we try to find a consensus between the three, three dimensions of economy, social aspects, environment, to a more regenerative model. But that's actually the theory because 99% uh, of companies in Germany at least are small and medium sized. And uh, they don't have that limit, that, that, that possibilities or that range uh, to do something uh, which is more uh, on that strong sustainability side or for the regenerative uh, management. This is a model that I uh, like to use because it's so simple. Maybe it's a little bit under complex, but Bob Willard, which is also a sustainability consultant from the US, um, he, drafted, uh, he developed that model starting with pre-compliance and ending up uh, what he calls a purpose or passion-driven company. So we see that there are some examples from whether startups or from also larger companies such as Patagonia, for instance, um, where the narrative at least is that uh, these are purpose-driven companies. So they are founded in order to solve a societal problem. 
but the majority of companies uh, that I know, uh, they are more in that earlier stages of the sustainability journey. Let's say at the level of pre-compliance. So I earn my money with companies calling me uh, because they are confronted with new legal regulations and they need to reach compliance. And this is the first step. And there is nothing with purpose and there is nothing with a sustainability mindset uh, they are only focusing on, on benefits and doing some steps in order to fulfill the legal requirements. And this will not help us in the end. So the next step would be compliance. And then you go beyond compliance and then to integrated strategy in order to enhance business value. But the majority of companies, I would say, they stop at level three or four they are not reaching that level of uh, becoming a purpose-driven business. And this is, to my mind, a structural problem. It's not because they don't want it. And I also see that we have that paradigm change starting. So for example, uh, together with my colleagues, we moderate or facilitate a network uh, of smaller companies that are looking on their energy consumption and which try to uh, to get more energy efficient and two years ago um, I can remember uh, one session with them where I was really disappointed that the, this was the time when Fridays for Future started up and this was also the time where science-based target initiative from WWF started and uh, Actually, they were laughing at me when I was saying that we need to reach zero net emissions in the year 2050 latest. Uh, but things are changing and uh, early October, we are going to start another network with smaller companies that are now trying to become climate neutral within the next 20 years. Uh, and, and this sort of companies are still capital market oriented and uh, owned by multinational companies. So these are not startups that are not family business. They, they are not state owned. So I see that we have that paradigm change coming, but it's, it's let's say, slow. And uh, one last thing I would like to focus on is uh, when I say that the, that the possibilities of those kinds of companies are limited due to what we call in Germany Sachzwänge. Uh, this can be shown very easily with this uh, with this slide. So the, most of the companies are in a big supply chain network, and when they try to influence their suppliers and the suppliers of the suppliers, so we are speaking about second or third tier of that. Uh, of that supply chain, then it will become very, very difficult because you don't have any influence and you don't have any, let's say, power or force uh, to get something, something yeah, developed for more sustainability. So that was, um, I'm afraid, quite confusing, but I stop here and wait for your comments. Thank you so much, Marcus. And I can assure you already, this was not confusing at all. So I'm looking forward to the conversation that you guys will be having. And I also thank you for staying in your time, which was not five minutes, but seven minutes. And I think that's just great. <laughs> all right. And last but not least, David, please come to the stage, give your talk, your comment. And afterwards, we really want to see you get into a discussion. So then we will have about 50 minutes left for all of you to talk to each other, share your thoughts, ask questions, and get out of those silos and into the conversation. Thank you so much for so many interesting presentations. There were a few things I expected to hear about in this discussion, which haven't come through clearly yet. So I'd like to build on what I've heard by emphasizing these points. I do agree that mindset matters. 
and that the way to fix the problems of climate change is going to be uh, people with an inspired minds who see things differently. I agree also with uh, with Alex that narrative matters and we are struggling to find the right narrative. Well, Petra gave us an interesting narrative and I agreed with uh, maybe three quarters of that narrative. She emphasized that there are problems not just of linear change in uh, climate, but potential exponential changes in climate. And I think that's entirely right. And some of the discussion about climate change sometimes loses sight of that potential urgency. I think one of the speakers said, well, maybe it's 100 or even 300 years before climate change will do real damage on the planet. Well, I think there are scenarios, lower probability scenarios, but there are scenarios in which great damage could be done in as little as maybe 30 years or even 10 years because of exponential change with uh, feedback cycles, which uh, we could have spent a long time discussing, but uh, I'll just mention that there are about a dozen feedback cycles that people have studied and are worried about, in which a small change could suddenly tip things over, and we could be on the point of the kind of large-scale species extinction, which has happened five times in uh, geological history, and in several of these five occasions, it did look like rapid climate change was part of the cause. So that part of the narrative I agreed with. I also agreed with the criticism of neoliberalism, that this uh, view that the state should be small and should not get involved in the market is one of the big causes of the problems we're in with climate change. Then we went on to the narrative that mechanistic thinking was the fault and we should displace mechanistic thinking with something more organic, more uh, natural or holistic. I think that's a bit vague, a bit flowery. I'm not opposed to mechanistic thinking. I just think we're doing the mechanistic thinking wrongly. So I'm not opposed to capitalism like a, a, a Yep, I think uh, capitalism can do wonders, provided it is properly steered and constrained. And what goes wrong is if the state is too weak to constrain capitalism, if the state is not able to break up monopolies, if the state is not able to ensure that sufficient attention is placed on externalities. I thought I'd hear more about externalities, but uh, well, I want to make that up now. The issue with capitalism is when it fails to put prices on these externalities, but capitalism can be fixed when these taxes are introduced. Take the case of the growing hole in the ozone layer, which at first the companies who were producing the CFCs, which were causing the ozone layer hole, they said, there's nothing we can do about it. But then the uh, politicians said, think harder, we're going to charge you more and the uh, innovation worked its wonders and we now have much better systems to do the same things that CFEs were meant to be doing with much less impact on the climate. So we need more carbon taxes. I did notice on the list from the Planetary Emergency Partnership, which uh, was shown earlier by Petra, item number one was the transformation of the taxation system. We should be doing much more with a progressive carbon tax why? Because then that will change the incentives which govern the way in which innovation is researched. We can fix the problems of dirty uh, climate, dirty energy, by being faster to develop clean energy. We are making some progress, some remarkable progress, but it's still nothing like fast enough. The improvements in solar and wind are rightly to be celebrated, but they are not taking place as quickly as necessary. And we're gonna need a whole lot more investment, but both private and public to make that happen. But we can do it. And so let's have more of these Pigouvian taxes, as they're sometimes known, named after the English economist Arthur Pigou. And yes, there are criticisms and difficulties with them, but it is the right framework. We can use some of the mechanisms built into the mixed economy to steer capitalism, to steer innovation, steer entrepreneurship. And there are other mechanisms we should be using more as well, such as the legal system to make civil cases against the companies that have been directly or indirectly linked to climate chaos and they may not be able to go in a 
uh, some kind of court cases, but there are civil court cases which can be done in which the balance of probabilities can be assigned and make the carbon emitting companies uh, responsible, just like the tobacco companies where on the in the end they were made responsible for the damage which on a balance of probabilities caused lots of people to get lung cancer in the same way the legal system can be exercised to put uh, civil cases to make the exxons and the other large oil companies of the world who have provably hidden the research which did show long ago that they were at risk of a uh, causing a great climate chaos they hid that evidence they should be held responsible and then there's the disinvestment campaign too, which can also take place. And they can come together, these different mechanisms, the carbon tax, uh, other taxes on externalities, the climate justice and disinvestment to cause a more swift transition. And my goodness, we're going to need a swift transition. We need to use all the innovative capabilities that are at hand, not just uh, today's solar and wind and wave energy, but next generation solar and wave and wind, which uses better mechanisms for storage, better networks. I believe we should be much more open-minded about reinvesting in nuclear. Nuclear is a very sad story in this. If we look back at the last 40 or 30 years, we have failed to invest in clean nuclear as anything like as much as was possible. We got misled by a false narrative about the dangers of nuclear. There are much more recent designs which are much safer, but the world has been misled by a rather poor quality of scientific discussion. And looking forward, there is nuclear fusion, which could come a lot more quickly if we really put our minds to it. Uh, in the past, people have struggled to see how this could work, but we now have made in, uh, innovations with uh, high temperature semiconductors, which allow different kinds of design, smaller designs, which can be developed and experimented with more quickly. And we can also use today's and tomorrow's artificial intelligence to improve the designs of these very complicated nuclear fusion systems. So let's put the incentives of the free market into place to prioritize these innovations by having these uh, taxes on externalities. And let's raise the narrative of the exponential dangers of climate change, which need to be met with exponential investment on the right kind of innovation. We don't need to throw away capitalism. We just need to steer capitalism and make it work. Thank you. Thank you, David. I think that's quite a progressive and interesting view on capitalism and nuclear energy, which I would love to explore further. Uh, but you said it, we need a swift transition. And actually to transition swiftly into our group discussion, I will just shortly and briefly give the word to Gitta so she can summarize what has been said so far in all of your great presentations and give you a good start into the open dialogue. Yes, thank you, Rebecca. Thank you all for your inspiring thoughts and the commitment you have um, delivered here. Uh, listening to all of you, um, something David said uh, um, motivated me to um, bring forth a, a summary slash question to all of you. David, you talked about um, shifting uh, sufficient attention and you said we need a swift transition. And uh, working with ordinary people and listening on Facebook, Twitter, on all social media to other people, um, mostly everything you um, have uh, talked about here is something that is not discussed in a broader um, um, public. That's quite fascinating to me. Expect uh, I, um, um, the, the people are aware that climate change is coming, but when I listen to Petra, uh, who told us uh, about all these fascinating people and uh, NGOs, etc., and Simon, who told us about the good and bad actions that are in conflict in his country, and Stefan, um, who uh, talked about business consciousness and his own conflict and how he raised his consciousness to a better uh, perspective on everything. And Alex, uh, where you, when you told us about the memes that are driving uh, our society stupid and you, market, uh, Marcus, about different types of business, 
uh, and about zero net emissions and David about constructive uh, a constructive approach on mechanistic thinking um, uh, provided properly. I think we can use this last half hour we have um, before the last statements to talk a little bit how can what can we do to make the public more aware of what is going on good in the world. Um, social media is filled with uh, toxic communication and um, you have delivered so much um, positive ideas and constructive approaches that um, the question uh, what has come to my mind is why aren't we talking about this in a broader perspective? Okay, so let's start with that if you like. I think any narrative that says the world is getting better and better is wrong. Any narrative that says the world is getting worse and worse is wrong. It's more complicated than that. At the same time, we are seeing some metrics as tracked by people like so-called rational optimists or the factfulness community by Hans Rosling and others. There are many metrics in which things are making significant progress. Poverty is going down. Uh, many parts of uh, industry are able to accomplish more from less as in the analysis of uh, MIT economist Andrew McAfee in his book of that same name, More From Less. But at the same time, we are storing up greater danger. I would be cautious about any uh, one-sided message there. We need to show people that we are living in the best of times and the worst of times, to quote uh, Charles Dickens from the start of uh, A Tale of Two Cities. And in fact, I'm actually quoting Rames Nam, the futurist, whose whole book, uh, which I may remember the, the, the name shortly, but he, he draws into this analysis at great length. We are doing amazing things, but the dangers are as never before. And that's what we need people to appreciate. The Infinite Resource, that's what Ramis Nam's uh, book is called. Uh, if I may jump in there for a second. Uh, so I, I, I was with you on a lot of things up to the nuclear thing, and there could probably be an interesting debate had about the, those elements. Uh, I'm not, you know, I would never discount it out of hand or anything like that. I've heard things that regardless of what you do, it's probably like on a kind of a slowish timeline of of putting it into action, even if it were safe enough or, you know, modular enough and all those good things. Um, but as far as the, the best of times, the worst of times, I mean, the, the arguments about improvements that have been brought about by neoliberal, uh, you know, capitalist uh, global supply chains and so forth, um, while certainly while they can't be discounted, of course, we are at the same time putting very much those gains at risk again. And, and, and I guess uh, this, this was, uh, I, I, I'm sorry, I forget the gentleman's name from earlier from, from uh, uh, who described, you know, how, how his, uh, his country had been affected by, by COVID-19 uh, situations. And, um, you know, that's, that's the risk, of course, that yes, whatever gains were made there, that, that a lot of those could easily uh, vanish again, too, if too many disruptions through climate change, climate crisis occur. I mean, if nothing else, the, the thing that you also pointed towards, the discontinuities that could occur uh, with feedback loops are, you know, putting lie to the terminology that's been used for decades now to kind of keep everybody sort of semi asleep on the things because global warming doesn't sound so scary. All things considered, uh, climate change also sounds more gradual, moderate, you know, certainly now the ante has been upped and, and more people are using climate crisis, climate emergency, uh, extinction rebellion, you know, Fridays for future as in either it's we're changing things or there is no future kind of thing. So, so the narrative and the, the verbiage used there has been has been upped but um so that's that's the danger i see there that of course everybody also has a tendency to to go right back to sleep and say oh but look we've done things we've already done things we're doing things so uh that would be my my caveats and, and points to throw in there just one quick clarification. I'm oh, not yeah. a fan of neoliberal uh, capitalism. I'm a fan of mixed market capitalism. Yeah. Okay. It's hard. 
Let me let me jump in, uh, Kita, uh, in response to uh, talking about the positive things. I do think that uh, you know I'm I'm an original. I'm a psychologist, and uh, um, I, I think you're quite familiar that there are um, there are thinking patterns, and if you continue a certain thinking patterns, then these thinking patterns manifest, and they become stronger and stronger and stronger. And so you will have people who complain and then they get everything that they see, they perceive in a way that they need to complain and, and so on. So I think, I think collectively we, we are in that pattern, definitely. And that's, that's definitely reinforced by media. And it may also be reinforced by social media, although social media has different ways. You know, there's also a bragging pathology in social media, like, you know, I'm great. Yeah. So, uh, so I do think uh, what we are lacking is the knowledge and understanding of the the both the thought leadership as well as the practice of diff, a different future because because the the negative things are being being reported but not the, the positive positive things unless you are in in part of a community and you know about it etc so i think there is a lot to do so it's not about kind of the the, the socialist way of saying you know everything is great and we've achieved beyond yeah so <laughs> what we planned uh, but it is definitely, uh, you know, like uh, creating a, um, a a communication about things that work and connecting people, um, you know, that do things that work. So uh, I think that is important in terms of um, in terms of the mindset sh shift. Um, I'm definitely against nuclear, you know, with um, quite a lot of background. Um, uh, there, there is a reason. I, I, I don't want to get into discussion on that. There are goods and bads and pros and cons. But what for me is the underlying thing about this uh, discussion process, and that is important for our uh, for the conversation about an economic system, is that um, you know, do we stay in a mindset where technology can fix everything? Yeah? So. It, because because that is a certain mindset and I agree with you David that it's not about the mechanistic view of the world or you know the only organic view of the world I do think the world is just bloody more complex than mechanistic view can at all you know kind of uh, you know kind of manage to 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 capture uh, but again it's not about an either or but it is about um, addressing and, and being able to to meet that complexity and the complexity is always life you know, it is a life. That is that is the core thing. That, you know that we need to talk about, and that we need to take care of, and that we need to steward. So um, the the issue is the danger that I see, and also in some of the uh, the, the climate crisis uh, responses, I see um, a, a, a desire to have the next technical fix, and and that means staying in the old paradigm. You know, and trying to to by all means kind of um, you know kind of survive you know by not really fundamentally changing and not really um, changing the paradigm. And my personal opinion is that capitalism is not repairable, but uh, but it's not about capitalism or socialism or capitalism or communism or you know whatever. But it's about putting something into the center that is um, in chaos theory. Uh, and Gita, you are kind of <laughs> the expert on that, I guess, <laughs> is the strange attractor, you know, that really shifts us into a different way of operating. And that isn't only easily captured by the term value you know, and ethics, yeah, because, because, because even ethics and value is something very um, superficial, you know, but, but it, is, it is the deep love for our role of serving life. And somebody has said, um, okay, who was it? Was it Alex? Uh, I don't know. Or was it Stefan? <laughs> uh, somebody has said, uh, and, and I know this because many people told me in the last couple of months, uh, you know, like the planet is going to survive, you know, even if we disappear. Yeah. So, and and, and interesting enough, I, 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 I immediately always said, yes, yeah, yes. And, and only after, you know, with a little bit of more thought, I said, no, we do have a purpose. There is a reason why we are here. Life produced us. And we should be bloody take our responsibility and our intelligence to further life. And so, um, and technology needs to be in service of that serving life. And that is for me, the, the shift that actually needs to happen.
Thank you. If I may add, yeah. Um, you know, if capitalism is the our ultimate goal of our society, and this is our our ultimate mindset and driving us, I think this is what got us into the current dilemma. And again, I want to stress that too many people are becoming ill based on the way how we live and work and what matters to us and what means to us. And too many are driven by capitalism, by money, by material things. And we are exaggerating. And the illnesses of humans is becoming epidemic. Again, I would be surprised if not every one of us had uh, people uh, around us with cancer or with depression or with diabetes. And it keeps growing and growing and growing. So not, you know, we, we look at nature, we, we believe that us humans are here and nature is there. Well, we are nature. So we are part of nature and the environment is getting ill and we are getting ill. And this is a sign that our current predominant paradigm, namely material wealth through capitalism um, is, uh, yeah, is exaggerated. We have, we have exaggerated it by now. And so I believe we need to transform that paradigm. I believe it's not about repairing capitalism. I believe that quality of life needs to be redefined. What does it mean to have quality of life? And it's not about having a, a larger car and in a few years, another larger car and in a few years, another larger car. I think quality of life needs to be redefined. I believe that the coronavirus is another cry of nature that causes us to stop and reflect globally. And it's the first time in my life where the health of society, actually the global society, was more important than the economy. First time in my life. And I believe it's a cry of nature to stop us and make us reflect and reflect on what is really important. We have been in lockdown um, and uh, th I think there is a reason for that. There is a philosophical reason for that. So there is, uh, um, amongst all the pain with, uh, with Corona, there, it has some aspects which are also healthy, namely that we, we take this major intervention which we cannot escape to reflect and to reframe of what is important in life. There is actually a lovely and interesting comment from our YouTube channel from one of the subscribers, Dominic, who is saying that maybe we should step away from that discussion of what is the right um, economical system or architecture, but rather focus more on which properties should the next economic architecture have. And he says um, it should be, for example, valid, functional, accessible, actualizing, sustainable. So maybe getting away from we are knowing these different systems and rather going to what should the next system entail and let's forget about the, the names for it. Any thoughts from you guys on this? Well, the yeah, most important thing is that it can't be the God. We should not be following the economy as the most important thing. Uh, my admiration for selected parts of capitalism is when we can use it as a tool to serve our other purposes. Things go badly wrong when we lose sight of a bigger picture and GDP becomes the most uh, important thing. Uh, so I do want us to bring this discussion in due course back to the topic uh, which uh, Petra raised already, which is what's the best alternative to the GDP and what are 
the metrics we should be measuring most. And it should not be that GDP is what motivates all of us. It is instead, how can we measure human well-being and uh, human possibilities in a general sense with minimal uh, uh, mental depression? Most people truly saying that they are mentally empowered, mentally very positive. All these things should be captured. And unless we get that right, uh, whatever economic system we design is likely to mislead us because the economics is the tool and it's not the driving force. It might help, it might help, it might help uh, that we uh, uh, are talking about two different things, capitalism and what is going on now in the world. These are two different things, I think. Capitalism as a concept, we can talk about this on, on a neutral platform. But uh, with what we are uh, facing right now is um, um, predator capitalism, and that is something uh, I think we should uh, uh, stop. I would like to hear, I'm sorry, Petra, um, I, I see that you wanted to say something. I actually want to uh, hear what Simon things about all of this we are talking about um, coming from a country that knows a lot about um, the economy is going down due to climate change and coronavirus and what he is thinking about us talking about uh, sustainability and a good ch uh, change in uh, consciousness or a conscious uh, shift. Um, um, I will keep in mind Petra that you wanted to say something but is it, is it okay with you? Yeah. Simon, you have to put on audio if you want to say something. Uh, okay, thank you. So may, may, maybe to to me, what? Uh, okay, I would like maybe to to add eh? to add mostly on the on the effect of uh, of Corona uh, to the mind to the mankind and the love uh, lifestyle. The way the way it is, and the uh, experience which uh, has led to today, day in day out uh, lifestyle. Uh, you may find, for example, like uh, the lockdowns. Uh, okay, and this one, I'm I'm saying the effect which uh, has brought to to the mankind to the mankind. Uh, is something which happened in my in my neighborhood, whereby a friend, a, a friend of mine, uh, was not in a position to to get uh, medical at, uh, medical attention. Uh, and this was the time when uh, we had uh, we had the lockdown in uh, in our country, whereby flag, uh, flights were were not. Uh, were were not in motion. Uh, that that guy was not in a position to go for his uh, for his uh, checkups in uh, in India. So eventually he he went into into a position of getting in getting a uh, medical care uh, in Nairobi, but. Uh, because of the intensity of the of the of the sickness, he could not it he could not sustain it. Uh, eventually, the guy passed on. So you may find the effect of a of a COVID nineteen. It has uh, adversely affected uh, the the mankind in that nature on the issue on the issue of a uh, of medical of medical care and uh, if it were not for for covid 19 then as a as a human nature that person today would have been alive uh, may, mainly because he could have uh, attended the, the medical care in india as he used to secondly i may say about uh, the covid 19 on its effects on the environment you may find on the many of the people when the lockdowns were in place, when the scarcity of things were in place, the fear that people, the fear that was inflicted uh, to people, many of the people that ran to the to the storehouses, the supermarkets, 
to to stock to stock in their houses because there was that fear uh, how or, or when maybe this pandemic could could take so many of the people that went to the to stock to stock the their items in their in their house and you may find the items that uh, the big percentage were in a position to be to be stocked most of them are canned foods are canned foods uh, because of the chef uh, shelf life that is uh, in them at least for for those for those items to take long time without expiring and uh, we may take for example the issue of the canned foods for example now after using the the, the canned food you have okay you have used the canned food for example now on the disposing that canned uh, the canned item you may find uh, not all the people are in a are in a proper position in disposing the canned item for example now it's a plastic you may find most of the most of those things were were being disposed anyhow in the environment by disposing those items in in the in the, in the environment they were affecting now our environment in one way or the other those items were were not recycled maybe the items are not recycled and then you may find the effect of the of the plastic containers the canned items how they affect the the human race and this came because of the issue of the of, uh, of covid-19 whereby me as a person because now i'm trying to stock myself with the with the basic necessity with me in one or the other you may find uh, i'm benefiting by stocking that item but in the the repercussion that comes in the disposing that uh, the can the kind item has a big percentage that affects our environment and also you may find on the i, I go deeper on the canned on the canned on the canned foods now on the on the canned foods the the health wise also it affects the human nature for example for example you may find we have the issue of the preservative that is used in the canned in the canned foods for example we have the the benzoic acid which is used in the preservation of the canned foods the the effect of the benzoic acid in the human in the human race it it affects the body the uh, the body nature the way it operates in in and out so you may find uh, in in uh, in the long run the benzoic acid in the body of a of a person it has a negative effect in a in in a in a person another thing you may find we have the issue of the uh, it's a bisphenol uh, bisphenol a or b which which has been uh, has been uh, has some chemical which leads to, to birth defects in children also that one in one way or the or the other the more that you use the canned items the more it affects your your body your body system so i may find all that has been has been in relation about the the covid-19 how it has affected the human nature how it has affected the, our environment and uh, the way the environment it is and this one I'm, I'm talking in relation to to our country about the way that we are, we are disposing our our items like in in, in our country nature uh, uh, in our country kenya it's a, it's a, it's, a, it's a bit complicated so you may find most of these items are, are littering around anyhow and the way those items are being littering uh, in a in a in our environment me as a person i find it's a it's a healthy uh, hazard to me and my and my community so and all this it came because of covid-19 thank you thank you very much simon petra you wanted to say something 
Yeah, I I wanted to, you know, I, I find it quite interesting to look at at how the how the situation is so different in in other countries, you know, like for example, Kenya. And um, but what I actually what what I wanted to say, you know, like was um, giving to you know I, I was I was referring to the comment, you know, and say it's not about the other system, and I think that is an important point because um, I, I thoroughly believe that capitalism in the form we experience it now is not repairable, you know? but that doesn't mean that capitalism has jewels, you know, that we could take into the future. And, um, and, and one of the jewels is the dynamic of markets, you know, which, which can be, which is a, which is an alive dynamic if it's contained you know, according to certain rules. Uh, what I wanted to say is, is um, and, and that's partly my concern, is um, it, it's, it's so far an important remark because many people who, who try to draft new models or new ways of doing, you know, kind of economic activities uh, tend to tend to so, so thoroughly believe in their own convictions, you know, in their own insight, which is which is helpful. But it's not helpful if it's like in silos. Yeah, so, and um, so I do. And, but what is interesting, even though that even that is in silos, then more and more people don't talk about how the future system is going to operate because honestly, we don't know. We can only work us, test us, prototype us towards the new whatever it is, you know, kind of, that's also why I talk about architecture because the architect is something overarching and, and, and um, in, in within can be very diverse, different ways of doing things. Uh, but, but what is more and more coming, you know, like, like John Fullerton, but also uh, Kate Rawat is also working in that direction, is, is um, modeling life in that way that life operates with principles and not principles in the, in the direct um, definition, you know, like we would find it in Oxford Dictionary, like principles. Yeah, so it's more like certain features that that relate with each other and that get into a dynamic complexity. But these features may they, they are identifiable if you look at at life processes, and and more and more people who talk about a future economy talk about principles. I'm also always a bit critical if these principles are too human, you know, like in, in the sense of we should all be moral. Yeah? So because, yeah, sorry, we had so many religions and um, they all had very, very good intentions and most of them turned into very brutal operations. Yeah? So, so it's not just the human ethical um, principles, but it is looking uh, that's also why I love um, biomimicry approaches, you know, to, to innovation. It's it's trying to understand, you know, what are what is the set of um, interrelated and and um, yeah relational principles, and and what it, what I discover is really that more people talk about a future economy, uh, talk about principles rather than describe the future system. Yeah, so we know it's not communism, it's not socialism, it's not capitalism, it's not any of the exploitative economies that we've had in previous centuries. Uh, yeah, so, and whether we give it this name or that name, spiritual economy or, or wisdom economy, or, you know, it, it doesn't really, in my view, it doesn't really help us. But what helps is to say, um, can we understand life? Can we work us towards understanding the features uh, that that would then give rise to many different forms because the issue about life is, and that's where there is a slight um, connection to capitalism. The feature of life is um, having operating with principles and out of these principles uh, is just an, an incredible huge complexity and diversity that is emerging. That, that, that's one of the most admirable features of, of evolution and, and uh, life of evol evolution. So in, in that way, uh, it's really important to say, we need to le learn us towards understanding what are the principles. And, uh, and from there, you know, we can then um, invent various forms of implementing these principles and, and, and they might be totally different in Kenya than they are in Germany or in Japan or in, you know, in other areas. That's what I wanted to say. 
Yeah, thank you. Um, I liked very much uh, earlier you, you said um, evolution um, has brought us forth with some sense behind it. Um, we are the first uh, species on this planet, as far as we know, <laughs> um, that are actually capable of changing uh, evolution itself. But via technology, via uh, reflect, uh, via reflecting on our own uh, consciousness and communication, um, I like that note very much. And um, Yip uh, talked about meta collaboration. I like that concept because of its um, dry and neut neutral aspects. Um, Petra, you pointed the uh, problems uh, are outcoming with ideology uh, or ideology, ideological impulses, um, which are always there driving us to think our vision is the best vision of all. So I would like to uh, 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 learn a little bit more from Yip and Markus. Um, what do you think? Um, um, what can technology do um, for the future technology in, co in context of communication, technology in context of energy? And also David might have uh, uh, something to say to this, if you like. Yip, for example. Can you hear me? Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Yes. Um... I would like to start to say that I feel very lucky that we are actually living in an age where we have the opportunity to synthesize different views, right? Right now, we're at the point where we can say that, you know, the Newtonian physics and the quantum physics exist at the same time. And you cannot say that the one is wrong and the other is right. right? So it's up to our generation, actually, to, to find a way to harmonize those. And we are at this point with many different things. And the same probably with mechanistic thinking and um, what, what would be the opposite of it? I forgot organic thinking or something like this. So there's always a way to, to harmonize both when we go one level higher with like one higher level abstraction and look at, look at it from the universal point of view. And when it comes to technology, in my view, we have a lot of opportunities now to use technology to learn from it about ourselves, right? We can use technology to learn about our patterns because in the end, technology or um, artificial intelligence could be just a mirror. And then we can look at all these things, the data that we produce and reflect upon it using our own human understanding and seeing how did this intelligence learn what it learned Right? What did we feed it with? Because this is what is missing to me in all our um, hypes about using artificial intelligence to say, oh, it can solve this and this and this problem. But in which way are we learning from what we created and then make it um, in, in that way, master it again, instead of being a servant to the technology? I think that's my view. Thank you. And uh, regarding technology, I'm 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 always moving beyond the two extremes. On the one side, there's that let's say low tech approach with sufficiency going back somehow. David was talking about that in the other session, and then the singularity techno progress approach. I think what we need to keep in mind is, and, and, and here I'm very interested in, in the way how we can govern or steer technological development, because as we know from history, there are always um, side effects of technological innovations. And we need to be very cautious that when trying to solve one problem I think we lost him. Marcos, are you still there? You, you, you others can hear me, yeah? It's it's not my we problem. Can hear you okay. Yeah, okay. Unfortunately, yeah, Marcos and Yes, will you send him a chat info that he uh, yeah, reset his video? 
Absolutely. In the meantime, David or Alex, uh, the two of you, uh, would you like to add something? So I agree. Uh, yeah. Oh, Alex, <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> no, you go ahead. <laughs> um, so I, I made a slide. I'm not going to, uh, you know, pull it all up. But like one of the things that stood out to me, you know, in the COVID discussion, that's that that's been, you know, near the forefront of how people talk about the GDP impacts, you know, the 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 uh, the business impacts and so forth is, um, you know, the con the question of whether the Swedish model, the much uh, <laughs> infamous vaunted, depending on who you listen to, a Swedish model, uh, what effects it had, and uh, they did have a little bit less of a, a drop in GDP in the second quarter compared to Germany and the EU average. So by about, I don't know, 8.6% uh, minus versus uh, Germany was like 10.1, EU 11-ish, 11.9. So, you know, by a few percent of GDP uh, that they bought themselves, so to speak, with this approach, which has uh, killed significantly more uh, of their citizens per, you know, capita, if you do it, you know, if you, if you calculate it per million, um, they actually haven't done better than some of the other Nordic countries, but the interesting thing is, uh, you know, they, it was even in their spiegel, you know, which that, that, <laughs> which is almost, I, I regard that almost as a slap in the face, uh, you know, the spiegel, it was like, well, so Sweden did a little bit better, you know, economically. And that's just somehow this frame that, that, uh, that can be slipped in there. When I was like, wow, you bought this with people's, with human lives, you know, this is literally like a live preview. It's been mentioned before, you know, that, that COVID is kind of like a weird preview into the future in many ways as pertains to climate change, uh, climate crisis, or even other issues. Um, a very strange time that we're living through right now. And so, yeah, this, this frame can just be applied. And you said, you know, uh, uh, predatory capitalism or, you know, you could say maybe just sociopathic, like sociopathic in the sense of, well, you know, we don't particularly want to hurt people in particular. We're not psychopaths, like psychopaths in my, at least by my definition, are the ones that take pleasure in, in hurting uh, others and, and, and creating pain for others. But they, um, but they're just okay with, you know, incurring casualties. In German, we say, you know, so they're just okay with it. And this is calmly bandied about and discussed. And, uh, you know, not to get, go any further into it, but this is just one of those things. It was like, apply it to climate change. It's like, how many people are you willing to ultimately sacrifice in whatever, however remote countries, uh, second, third world, otherwise, um, how many are you willing to sacrifice to uphold your current, what you assume as your rightful standard of living, let's say, or your your jobs that you that you want to stay the same for you know a relatively indefinite amount of time that sort of thing so anyway i know that's not the the, the brightest or, or most positive note maybe to end on but then again it is kind of an emergency if we do take it seriously maybe we also have to up the ante on the on the language used and the narratives used a bit so wake people up all right thank you so of course the the report on climate change is issued every few years. Uh, it has a scientific section and an economic section. And the economic section is largely written by economists and the scientific section is largely written by scientists. And famously, the economic predictions have been rather modest. They have been influenced by the work of the one person to have won a Nobel Prize in this field of economics, William Nordhaus who uh, said, well, actually, there won't be that much uh, economic impact, even if the climate becomes much worse. And this was sort of taken for granted by many people that this is a correct analysis. And recently, there's the book False Alarm by Bjorn Lomborg, who describes himself as a lukewarmer. He says there is some risk of climate change, but it won't be that bad. And he puts a lot of stake by the economic modeling done by William Nordhaus. I was very interested to see just a few days ago, a detailed rebuttal of William Nordhaus's analysis. First of all, there is no taking account of the possibility of exponential change or tipping point models 
those are discounted in there. It's just a modest in ch change. Secondly, the assumption is if you work indoors, you won't be affected by climate change. You know, all the industries which are indoors, they continue whatever the weather, so they'll continue whatever the climate. And there's a whole bunch more there. So I think uh, these parts of the United Nations reports on climate change, the scientific part is uh, something very solid. The economic part has been dominated by people with this neoliberal disposition, which we need to fight against. And I'm very glad to have seen that uh, rebuttal. Once I find the link, I'll post it into the YouTube chat as well. In terms of uh, technology improving human lives, uh, can we trust it? Well, one story that's often told is we look at the lifespan. Uh, uh, just going back 200 years, the average lifespan was something like maybe 40. The average woman, if she didn't die herself young age, she would see maybe seven of, uh, five of her seven children dying before she did. You know, in most of history, it was miserable and terrible. But thanks to improvements such as antibiotics and vaccinations, this is the usual story that's told, we now have pushed up a uh, life expectancy expectancy to double uh, to something well over 70. But I will caution against this uh, overly simple story that puts all of the praise on the technology. Actually, many of the most important health initiatives were done by politics, not by technology. They were insisting on pasteurization of milk, for example, because before milk was pasteurized, far too many children got infections from cows. They insisted on cleaning up dirty water. So all of these things actually were done by politics and that has a big role to improve health as well. So I am, um, in favor of politics steering technology and even more of human values steering politics and steering technology. Technology is Thank like you, the economy, May it's a tool. I ask you to hold that thought. We have just a little interruption because Petra has to leave us right now in the minute. So we just would I'd like to take the opportunity to say thank you and goodbye. And Thank you. see you next time, hopefully. Thank you very much for your participation. I enjoyed your talk and your participation in this discussion very, very much. Thank you, Petra. Have a lovely evening, and I hope we see each other soon again. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much. Well, you. I really enjoyed it. Really enjoyed it. Bye. Lovely. See Bye. Bye-bye. And now... David, back to you and also back to Marcus, who is back. And um, I have seen, David, you are also very active on the YouTube channel. So maybe you might want to draw a bit of the discussion that is going on there also back into our room here so we can close that link. And I'll let Marcus speak now if he, I mean, he's got the things which. Yeah, thank you, David. But I have a question to you, actually. Um, you, you said that steering technological innovation could work via financial incentives, let's say carbon tax or another kind of tax that uh, allows internalization of external costs. And then we talked a lot about uh, the, let's say, meta narrative, the purpose or what guides our decision. Is there something more or is it that? Because we are talking about the internalization of external costs since Pigou is dead, let's say, which is... 1959, I think he died. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Same year I was born. Uh, no, uh, Pigou was out of fashion for a long time. And then after the crash of 2008, 2009, he was one of the people that uh, got uh, brought back briefly into attention. We need to assert this more vigorously. You know, neoliberalism has been uh, very successful for all kinds of reasons. Uh, one reason they've been successful is that there is a narrative that says big government always uh, gets in the way. Uh, government, I was heard recently, is the most dangerous invention that has ever been. You know, uh, It's like uh, nuclear energy, but what, even worse, because uh, we create the state to stop us uh, falling into local chaos, and the state organizes us into global chaos. There's a famous saying, uh, war made the state and the state made war. Uh, so indeed, there is a big fear of states that are too powerful. But the answer to that, and this is a, 
uh, elaborated, and I'm going to give yet another book recommendation, I'm sorry. It's in the book called The Narrow Corridor by Dara Nasimoglu and James Robinson. It's an amazing book. It's very long. It's too long, so most people won't finish reading it. But basically, they say the Le Leviathan, which a, a government often is, needs to be tamed. There needs to be a strong state able to counteract uh, strong monopolies and the uh, economy, but there also needs to be a strong network of uh, society. You need a strong state and a strong society. And that society has distributed power. It has a good free press. It has independent judiciary. It has a regular elections. And if you just have a strong state without a strong society, then you will end up with the government doing very bad things. And many of the liberals see the bad things that governments do, see the pink, the white elephant uh, projects, they see the crony capitalism, and they say, we've got to stop this at all costs. But now I say there is a better model, and we need to make sure that's not forgotten. But sadly, it has been forgotten, and we need to re reassert it, the, the benefits of the mixed economy. So that's a narrative. It's a complicated narrative, but it's a narrative that needs to be told. Otherwise, uh, people will just try to focus on one part of the story and not the other part we actually need this mixed uh, model of the economy and the mixed model of uh, politics too thank you uh, if you could put that uh, recommendation book recommendation in the chat would be nice uh, I, I was uh, interrupted by technology uh, but i was actually showing that uh, that simple model this is uh, which is also like a, a model of mixed factors influencing change and these are only external things you are absolutely right that change needs to start from within let's say internal change um, but i use that model very much uh, which says that we need technology we need society or civil society uh, which are responsible for like scandalizing certain issues. I think Alex was talking about uh, the influence of Fridays uh, for Future. Then we need that uh, regulatory push, the strong state. And on the other side, there are not only push factors, but also pull factors, which is regulatory pull in terms of incentives, financial incentives, um, like subsidizing uh, technology development and some sort of market pool and also vision pool uh, which is often connected to leading uh, persons like in inventors uh, at the top management of companies that are trying to develop their companies with a certain purpose i'm done Okay, and I think then we are at the final round, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Gitta, would you like to pose a question for the final round or you want me to do that? Um, I'm still on the question I had, uh, which um, I, had, uh, I got actually not really answers. What can we do? Yeah, the question I always ask people is, uh, what would someone from the future uh, would say about what we are doing now and what would he or she wants from us. Simon, you want to say something? You have to unmute, Simon. Thank you for that. Yeah, uh, I, w I want to toward something uh, which uh, I remembered. Uh, because of the the job the the job cuts that uh, we we experienced in our in our country because of uh, the layoffs and uh, some of the guys had to to take unpaid leaves uh, you may find now uh life is it's a uh, is somewhat difficult uh, life is somewhat difficult to some to some uh, to some of us so you may find maybe because of this uh as a person you need to have some uh, alternatives in uh, in making sure that you you get some uh, 
some substitutes in day to day in day to day life in this in this uh, I, I want to talk about uh, we have experienced the issue of uh, deforestation in uh, in our country and uh, on the issue of uh, deforestation in our country uh, I think we we understand what the deforestation can bring uh, in the in the in the in, in our environment and in in nature uh, at large and the uh, deforestation has been brought about by some some of uh, some of the mankind in Kenya in uh, substituting uh, in getting the firewoods in getting in burning uh, firewoods to get charcoal uh, so as to get a uh, a livelihood in uh, in their day to day uh, businesses because you may find maybe a person who was working uh, was working somewhere somewhere now he's not uh, doesn't have uh, uh, the monthly revenue or weekly wages now he has no no alternative but uh, cutting down uh, a tree either to get uh, to get firewood or to get charcoal to sell to get uh, something uh, for 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 the daily bread and also you may, you may you may find that person maybe has to to get firewood or charcoal to substitute maybe from the gas. Maybe he was using gas before the issue of uh, Corona when, when, when uh, the pandemic came. Uh, he was working. So for him now to, to use gas in cooking, it, were, it wasn't maybe a, a big issue. But now the working capital is not there. Uh, he, he has nowhere maybe to, to get uh, uh, funds or some coin maybe to, to buy gas. Uh, he will not now just uh, uh, go hungry and because he cannot get uh, that commodity. Now he, he will love now to go and get some firewood or maybe to get charcoal. And from that, the, the, the act of uh, the frustration is taking place. So now we can see how the effect of COVID-19 has brought to the, to the environment. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Simon. Uh, you brought our attention to the problem that with the coming crisis, climate crisis can become even worse because we are not uh, caring for people who are poor in other countries who have no other alternative than to destroy nature any, uh, even more. Thank you very, very much. Um, um, we have 10 minutes left, so um, let's keep it short. Um, if everyone would like to make a brief statement at the end, that would be lovely. Yip, will you like to start? What would the statement be about, Gitta? Whatever comes to your mind now, what is dear to your heart concerning this uh, conference we have? Yeah, I really love that we came together and spent our limited precious lifetime um, to, to share about our views. And I would hope that each of us becomes a micro investor or a real, like a big investor to support these projects that turn attention towards beautiful things in, in, in life. Thank you so much. Okay, yeah, Stefan. Um, yeah, I am very, very grateful uh, for this dialogue that you organized it, uh, for the many diverse perspectives it, it broadened my mind, and uh, I'm very thankful for that. Um, and looking forward, a let's have more forums like this. Uh, that's what we need as society. Um, if I had a wish, you asked what would we do. I have two wishes. Number one, 
that would we, we would introduce a quality of life index at societal level next to the gross national product. And number two, that uh, we would introduce common goods balance mandatory for all organizations in addition to their financial balance sheet. Just some, some governance uh, interventions uh, that um, would create a high leverage. Thanks a million for this dialogue. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Wonderful. Markus, you Yes, are... thank you. Thank you all uh, for the diversity of inputs. Uh, Stefan, I got the question. You you did not say which company it was uh, with the first the first chemical company, as I understood, with a common good balance. Are you? Do you want to share it with us? Uh, it's Lily Germany. Lily. Lily, yeah, Lily right. Germany. Yeah. Never heard of that. Interesting. Uh, I think that uh, approach from Felba is very interesting. Um, finally, just. Thank you from my side. It was really inspiring with all your ideas and perspectives. Thank you. Okay, thank you. David, a final statement? One of the former chief science officers in the United Kingdom, David Mackay, in his book on uh, sustainable and unsustainable energy, had the statement, if everyone does a little, it will add up to a little. In other words, uh, just individuals taking action will not be sufficient for us to change this world. There are larger forces at hand. We will not be able to solve this problem without political intervention. We need to change the narrative. And as more people speak intelligently in the public, there will be more politicians who take up that call. And in due course, the politicians will impose the right kinds of incentives, the right kind of taxes to steer economy more fully. So let's build on this conversation today, a very good conversation, because we will not manage to solve this problem just by a few inspired individuals or even a few inspired companies. It needs national level and even global action. Yeah, thank you. And Alex, some last ideas, last memes we can take with us. Um, you know, I'll, I'll yield my time back. <laughs> I used up <laughs> enough earlier. <laughs> but uh, I really uh, had a very interesting time listening to y'all. Uh, so many different perspectives. I hope I got to contribute just a little bit with this particular, very particular lens that I look at the world through not at all times but certainly for these business purposes and if anybody uh, feels you know somehow inspired or enlightened uh, to you know go down those routes uh, then by all means i'm also open to further discussions on that at all times i'm, I'm pretty active on twitter so you can always find me there uh connect and uh, you know argue in public or in private either way it's fine by me all right you all have a great one. Thank you. What I'm taking with me here is um, that um, from wherever we come and what field of expertise we might have, we all share the same visions. We might not agree on every single thing, but uh, it is a fascinating thing to me to listen to experts from everywhere and to people who are really connected to the problems of our time and to see that we all care. Yeah, everyone in his or her single way, we care and we try to do something. And, and I think that's a, that's a good start. Yeah, so thank you very much for your time and collaboration and your life's energy you put into this. Um, I hope you stay put. We have two conferences left today. You will see me uh, at uh, 1.45 a.m. tomorrow falling into my bed <laughs> after more than 12 hours talking. Um, but this is really worth it, and I'm grateful for everything you did here. Thank you so much. And thank you guys for moderating so great. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Rebecca. You did so fantastic. <laughs> well, I, I would have been totally uh, lost without you. <laughs> all Many fine. Times. Thank you all so much for having me, humoring me while interrupting you. And I had a great pleasure listening to all of you. So many wonderful thoughts. 
last but not least, it's my job then and my duty to show you that we will have many other wonderful conference talks as well during the next hours. So please feel free to tune into the uh, YouTube channel, listen, comment, share with people. We are looking forward to having you for further discussion. Thank you all so much and see you next time. Thank you, Rebecca, and thank, thank you, you all. <laughs> thank you, bye. bye.